Uh, we are actually live at the moment. So right on, technical issues aside, introductions made. It's another wonderful Wednesday. Thanks everybody for showing up in chat and catching this on replay. We appreciate you and your support. So please let me turn it over to the hosts, Brian and Marco. What's up, Living Soul Nerds? Happy Wednesday to you. Uh, you know it's going to be a, a good show when we have a little bit of a technical issue behind the scenes. So got that uh, mapped out. Uh, for a lot of you guys that are fans of the show, uh, you've probably seen Greg uh, a couple times now. Uh, there's a reason for that. You know, there's there's certain individuals that I've come across in life that I feel like really represent the community. And, uh, you know, over the past few weeks, especially, we've been kind of interviewing those individuals uh, that's another reason why I wanted to reach out to Greg and have him on this side of, of the aspects and having him with Marco. I think that we're going to be able to dive deeper into uh, really Greg's mindset. You know, when a lot of people reach out to us from the show, uh, it seems overwhelming to grow high end cannabis or to be able to compete with people at the commercial level, uh, because a lot of those guys do have like a decade or more, two decades deep into into farming. Uh, but when it comes to a living soil side of things, you know, not too many people are up there, you know, five plus years. Some of some of those guys are probably at a decade now. Uh, but but again, this is more of a newer uh, growing style. So uh, there's a lot of things to learn from Greg. I know that, um, you know, when you first get into this, you think that awards and stuff really matter. Uh, and sometimes they do. In my opinion, it, it's more of what your peers think of you. You know, how, how does your network actually represent you? Uh, and that's something that Greg can speak uh, volumes on. I mean, we're going to dive deeper into that. He, he's definitely um, growing cannabis and just carrying himself in a way that I, that I hope more individuals uh, maybe emulate. You know, maybe that's the, not the right word, but uh, see, see for themselves that there's a lot of ways that you can carry yourself and farm cannabis. And if you really put your head down and, and kind of put your nose to the grind for a few years, uh, it's pretty amazing what you can achieve and just, you know, just a couple of years in general. So, uh, Marco, I'm, I'm excited for you to be able to interview Greg as well. I want to give you the mic, sir, and uh, then we'll kind of get get deeper into this and chop it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, happy Wednesday again, uh, Living Soil Nerds. Uh, great to meet you, Greg. First time meeting Gene O.M. Alchemy. So think of genome as in genes, genetics. Uh, it goes by Greg. I'm excited about this one. I always like when the guys are hands on and you can see uh, behind him, he's hands on. He's had, he has yeah. his ladies and, <laughs> and, and babies there doing their thing. So, um, yeah, this will be a great one. And also, you know, just anybody that's doing it the natural way, um, thinking that soil first, a living soil first and those microbes, you know, is, is someone that, that I'm really excited to speak to. So, yeah, Greg, why don't you just uh, jump in, man, and kind of tell folks about yourself and, um, and we'll get started. Right on. Well, nice to meet you too, Marco. Stoked, uh, stoked to be here. And um, thanks again, Brian, for having me on the show. I think this is third time you've invited me. And, um, you know, I think I kind of took over the show at the NOCO Expo last year, just kind of stepped in and, you know, inter interrupted everything you had going. But regardless, um, I'm super stoked to be here. Um, kind of genetics and living soil and growing has been my play for 10 years now. Um, I've been doing the thing in Colorado. I'm from Colorado. I live in Colorado. Um, you know, one of the the legacy growers here to where before um, all the legalization and things like that, when we could be caregivers and we could sell the, the dispensaries and, you know, kind of like the glory days of cannabis in Colorado is what I like to talk it, chalk it up to. But it was, um, those were the days, 2008, you know, doing the thing. Started working for um, a couple of different dispensaries and commercial grows. Um, shortly after we weren't allowed to sell the dispensaries anymore and just kind of, you know, scaled up everything that I'm used to. So going from normal home grow to, um, upwards of 60,000 square feet of greenhouse is where I was at, um, at the beginning of 2020, um, things have kind of changed since then. And I'm focusing a lot more on hemp and hemp genetics. And then as far as the day to day, and then, you know, of course, THC stuff's always in the development. Um, I always got seeds available and I'm constantly making them and constantly testing them. Um, and the natural way, albeit, you know, I think living soil is, uh, super important for genetics. And I think you can really get the true expression of what, uh, you're going for, um, with living soil. And so I breed that way. Um, not only because it'll hook up nicely with anyone else is growing living soil, 
throw your seeds in there. I already got biology on them. They're already, you know, happy and healthy and used to the system. Um, but more than anything, it's just, I, I believe in kind of this model for, for production and, you know, kind of just permaculture in general in our lives, you know, it doesn't have, it goes way beyond growing cannabis or growing your own food or farming in general. You can apply a lot of these kind of living system principles to, you know, your daily life. So, um, that's kind of my focus, you know, cannabis has been, uh, my medicine and my focus as far as, um, plants go specifically for breeding. But I think if you grow cannabis, you should be growing polyculture and you should be growing lots of other things too, whatever you like. And certain things work better with each other, but just grow plants, be house plants, whether it be weed, whether it be, you know, vegetables for you to eat or medicine other than ganja, you know? super important so um, I, know, I want the audience to know real quick that you live and breathe this it's not like you're just saying that and you have you know your indoor it, like if you're ever lucky to go over to his house best believe the front and the backyard and like a regular neighborhood is just basically stacked uh with plants and with things growing and you know if you drove by greg's house uh here in colorado it would stick out immensely because of all of the stuff that he's farming in the in the spring and the summer so that's something else that I kind of want you guys to see. Like the, the more that I can reach out to gentlemen that are, that are doing this, not only farming cannabis, but farming food, that way that you guys can kind of either get some ideas or pick their brain. Uh, this is the next level, I think, is, you know, from what I understand, Greg, that, you know, you're self-taught uh, and you're really just going out there and actually putting in the work. And I know that sounds so simple, but in reality, when you're first getting into that, those are the two principles uh, that are really going to build that foundation. Uh, so I just wanted to let the audience know that you're not only farming cannabis, but you are true to your roots and continuing to farm. Um, it, it looks to me, buddy, as many plants and as much vegetables and fruit as you can. Oh, yeah. If the weather wasn't about to turn sour outside, I'd be out there taking the call out there, um, you know, in the greenhouse or something. But I had to batten down the hatches. We're about to get cold. Um, Brian, you know this, but we're about to have a it's about to get down to like 22 degrees. And I got all my winter crops outside and you know, I want to make sure that they're all good. So, um, all my greenhouse and everything's all, <clears throat> um, you know, frost cloth and, you know, kind of not much to see out there at the current moment or else I'd be out there. But, um, yeah, man, I mean, self-taught for sure. Uh, when it comes to cannabis and just kind of learning from the heads, the same way that the newcomers are coming in now and learning from people like me when I started growing weed and, you know, my first house in 2004, um, it, I looked to a couple of people that I knew were doing the thing, but it was, there wasn't nearly the access that we have now. So as being a beginner and trying to get into it, you know, it's a lot easier now because people are open about it back then. Shit. You didn't tell anybody you were growing weed because of all the risks associated with that. Um, no matter what state you were in, you know, Colorado it's, it was a felony in 2004, like it is in the South now, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, I do have an environmental biology degree, so I'm kind of, I do have a little bit of background. My parents um, also, you know, have horticulture degrees. Um, I grew up on a 30 acre farm um, and greenhouse production for cut flowers and, and all that stuff my whole life. Um, so, well, at least the first part of my life and then, you know, suburban the rest of the time. So I do have a bit of a background on it, but, you know, it's a constant learning process. I've learned more in the last five years than I, than I did in the previous 10. And I hope, you know, every year just continues to compound that knowledge. So, yeah, nice, man. I think that's, um, you know, for people listening, you know, it's kind of in your DNA, you know, growing plants, you know, your parents did that. So, you know, it's kind of in you. So like if you, if folks out there, if your parents did not grow up, they did, you know, start with you, you know, you be the one that goes out there. Now we're the gardeners. We're starting that next generation for your, for the next offspring to kind of have that in, in them to grow their own food and their own plants. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, hemp, man, because, you know, a lot of folks are just only focused on, you know, cannabis, you know, THC, THC. Why is it important to grow hemp and why is it important for people to keep pushing uh, hemp in, in, in those ways, even though, you know, legalization may be right around the corner. Maybe talk to, to folks a little bit about that. I mean, for obvious reasons, people, you know, some people know, some people may not, but, you know, essentially any product that's made with plastic, with wood or out of a textile, 
um, you can make with hemp and, you know, just deep down the technology rabbit hole as you want to go, you know, I mean, there's studies coming out now about hemp, you know, ion batteries and, and stuff that actually perform better than lithium and, um, you know, hemp plastics and, you know, gr literally growing fields of plastic instead of, you know, processing and pulling fossil fuels and all sorts of stuff, you know? So aside from the cannabinoid farmer, which, you know, admittedly everybody that got on the hemp train was like all right this is how do we transition from legacy thc to hemp farming which is you know high cannabinoid but not thc um people just started growing hemp like they grow weed and developing genetics and i'm the same way i've developed lots of genetics for smokable flour in the hemp kind of realm industry and i just think that that's really narrow um as i don't want to be rude to the folks that just have switched over and like you know that's their model they want to grow smokable hemp because they can sell it in certain places and it's federally legal like i get all the benefits of that but i think as um all the uses for hemp go i think it's important to look outside of the the cannabinoid realm and look at all the industrial uses for it and i think there's a movement right now and i'm, I'm seeing lots of um, capital being infused into like textile or processing plants for um for hemp stock and you know all of the things that come along with that and i think now that money's starting to get infused and i think the people that are like all right i was growing 30 acres or 50 acres of cannabinoids for hemp and um you know high cbd stuff and um you know stuff for extracts and super important medicinal compounds but uh i think you can start growing a thousand acres of textile hemp and we can make you know, some real progress. And I also think that I always revert to the metric when talking about hemp, that you can grow a 1400 square foot house on just over two acres every season. So just think about the implications of, you know, carbon negative housing, um, not only as you're growing it, but for the life of the house, it's absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. Like how cool is that? How ridiculously cool is it to be able to grow your structures and grow an entire house minus the the electrical part of it obviously but uh hemp's just important for all the reasons that um regenerative agriculture is important you know we can save the planet with this with this plant i mean it says idealistic there's lots of ways to, to do it wrong but um when it talks about just carbon capture and sequestration and building soil and remediating toxic whatnot and then all the products that come down the line from that um it's just no it's a no-brainer this this plant is super impactful on every community whether that be you know small third world communities that you know maybe don't have access to concrete or it's thing expenses are what they are um, being able to to provide locally a lot of the things that you would have to import i think could be achieved with with hemp and just in a very general way and i think that uh, the more that we try to grow it and promote it, and uh, there's going to obviously be a lot of competition and, you know, people that are lobbying to stomp this out because there's huge business and, you know, 75 years of industrial agriculture that we're going to have to put to bed by doing this. But um, I think it's important. And I think folks that um, you know, THC is strong. Let's be real. Some, a lot of places, like some folks, like they don't, they don't need some 25, 30% THC. That's not the medicine that they need. So, um, even just basically growing, throwing a few hemp plants out in your, you know, on your plot, on your farm or in your backyard or on your patio or something, um, can be the difference between someone having their medicine or not. So I know I just touched on a whole bunch of topics, but <laughs> yeah, man, great <laughs> answer. You touched on a lot of things. <laughs> Hemp's the future, I think. Yes, sir. Well, you got a, you got your hoodie on, man. You know, there's a, there were definitely some pioneers, uh, you know, that were educating individuals. Jeremy Silva is obviously one of them with Build a Soil. Uh, there was definitely. Kevin with Rootwise, uh, continuing to educate uh, those gentlemen, as well as a, a dear friend of mine and of the show, Sticky Lungs, put together an event. Uh, I, I like to always promote you on this, Greg, because <laughs> I felt like those. There was only two of them, unfortunately, because of COVID. Uh, but those were actually done where, the, you know, I was I was lucky enough to, to judge your cannabis. Uh, the way that it was done was that we were given, um, you know, four weeks to kind of wake up every morning and try somebody else's cannabis. 
your stuff really stuck out. Uh, when we when we showed up for, for judging that day, you know, a lot of individuals um, kind of already knew you were kind of the dark horse or, or the one to keep your eye on. So uh, there, there's a bit of um, earned clout that you have, man. And I, I want the viewers to understand that as we go deeper into this interview. It's there's so many guys out there now that are teaching classes and all these things. And I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But at the same time, some of that stuff is just kind of bullshit, man. Or it's like it's somebody else's concepts and they just put a little spin on it. And now they're talking. What I, you know, Marco and I wanted to give the audience today is, you know, not only are you doing this stuff, man, but behind the scenes, you're putting in the work like you're 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 growing your own stuff. You're doing your own genetics. And there's so many guys out there that put a little spin on something, throw it out there genetics wise or educational wise. And now all of a sudden it's theirs. Uh, that's why I wanted to highlight you today, man. And I hope we could talk about what you put into the to Sticky Lungs Cup uh, for you guys out there to know that it, it was kind of the a fantastic lineup of judges. I felt like the, the way that they went out, the way that it was done, uh, and it just kind of proved that individuals wanted to be there and we needed something from a living soil side of side of things uh, so that, you know, you could basically could be judged. I feel like when you are, when you finish flowering out, you do want your peers to judge you and you want it to be in a structured way. Uh, so I just want to kind of talk, uh, Greg, about the strain that you entered and why you're making your own genetics and what it really takes to put in the work uh, to kind of catapult yourself, uh, because at least around here, buddy, you're uh, you're well known, man, and the, and the cloud is well earned. Well, well, I appreciate that. Um, I'm a super low key guy, and you know, you're not going to catch me at too many events. Um, you know, I've got a lot going on, and just my little space with my urban farm, and um, you know, with all the projects I got going, you know, so. Um, I would like to show up more in the community, um, but things as they are, just keep my head down and grind, you know, and that's, uh, um, it's double-edged sword. That's good and bad. So the fact that I'm able to come on a show like this and that people may or may not know me is like super, just, I'm honored and super humbling um, because I don't, uh, I don't promote myself that well and I don't really do it that often. So um at least in the, in regards to the cup, you know, I kind of felt like, I mean, it was the first, um, for at least my, um, my homegrown flower, the first cup that I was able to enter. Um, and I entered Fantasia, which is a strain that I made, um, with Genome Alchemy Seed Company, um, it's across a purple fantasy and platinum Tesla. Um, the platinum Tesla is another, um, it's kind of, I guess, let me back up for a second. My genetics that I make and the Fantasia included, um, I started doing it because I wanted to see something a little different. And I also wanted to explore lines that no one else is doing, um, way out of the, you know, hype train kind of area and very much digging into stuff that you don't see that often and then developing my own lines and then being able to outcross from all my stuff. So if you see my menu, um, which I don't know, I might send it to you at some point and put it up, but it's, a uh, um, everything that is used in my breeding is at least the males is worked by me and it's made by me. It's not, I'm not taking someone else's pack, um, popping it, picking a male, making the nest hype thing going down the line that way. So obviously you got to start somewhere. So I did that initially, but nothing that I released was ever, um, like a direct cross from, uh, someone else's pack. So I started with that. And of course I had no idea what this cup was going to be like the home growers cup. Um, in, I guess, 2000, is it 18 or 19? I'm like a lost year. I think uh, it was yeah, 18. 18. Cause then 18 uh, is when I won. And then AJ won AJ from Bill's so I'm growing organic next year. But, uh, you know, there was no stipulation about it being in living soil. There was nothing like that. So me coming in being a super organic gardener, you know, it's a lot of times my chronic isn't, um, you wouldn't pick it off the shelf as having the most beautiful bag appeal you've ever seen. And, um, until you crack the jar, it may not be the, you know, the first thing you go for. And obviously this was blind testing. So no one really knew the strain, but I mean, at that time, nobody knew what Fantasia was. I hadn't released it to the public really. Um, you know, a few packs have been sold here and there, but I really wanted to make a, an impression and not only come in with living soil weed when I know there's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of synthetic salts and a lot of, you know, chronic weed just 
not my style. Um, and then wanted to come through with my own genetic to, to maybe showcase the fact that not only can I grow well, but I can breed well and I can win, um, competitions with, um, with my genetics too. So, um, that was my thought. And I had no, there was quite a few people that I recognized there that I know as growers. And, um, I didn't have much hope that I was going to win first. I knew what I brought to the table was chronic, but, um, I was very surprised as surprised as, you know, a lot of other people when my name was the one that was called for first place. So, um, I was honored and I was the community spoke, you know, and I thought that was, uh, thought that was really cool. And it was super like highlight <laughs> of my year, most definitely. And I can talk about it now. I'm proud of that shit, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think even at that time, everybody really understood what it would look like potentially was going to be something really cool that was going to happen year after year. And then of course, yeah. you know, nobody knows about when a pandemic is going to happen, but to highlight it again, man, I just, there were uh, a lot of, I would consider kind of like legendary, uh, breeders and stuff that were part of the judges and some of us that were just kind of local. Uh, but it, it was definitely a um, organization is probably the best way I could describe it. Like I felt like it was the first time where we I've done a couple of the judging stuff. And when it's all done in one day, to be honest with you, I mean, that, that's not fair. I mean, it's yeah. not fair to the judges. It's definitely not fair to the contestants because most of those that are set up, you know, they're paying a, a pretty good pretty heavy price for the average farmer. Probably some of them are like, you know, 250, 500 bucks plus the cannabis, uh, plus all the time spent and all that. So I, I always wanted things to be fair, things to at least, you know, on the outside, like kind of look fair, where it's like, Hey, at least we're trying. So they tested your cannabis as well at that, at that cup. Uh, again, there were, you know, I can't remember everybody that was there, but I think if you go back to sticky lungs thing, he never posts. So you could probably still see uh, pretty easy who all was there, but, Totally. Your stuff really stood out, man. And I don't mind. I don't think this, you know, the viewers have ever. I, I don't mind, you know, cheerleading individuals that I feel like need to be highlighted. And you're you're a bit of a hybrid, man. You're more of like some of the homies that I have that would never fucking come on the show that have this, you know, kind of the same talent and trying to do the, some of the same stuff you do would never do that. Uh, but then on that flip side, man, you're not out there constantly trying to get that. So I, that's why I wanted to highlight you is because I think more individuals can really see that there are a lot of fantastic farmers out there. They might not necessarily be on Instagram or they might not necessarily have all the followers to make you think that, that hey, I need to spend time listening to what this gentleman or this uh, woman has to say. Um, the reality is, is that you, flower used to speak for itself. And I hope in time that it kind of comes back to that where, uh, you know, you, you can say all these things, you can do all these into things, but, you know, Flower is kind of what puts you on the on the map, and uh, Greg is one of the best here in Denver. Yeah, good stuff. Hey, Greg, um, what about that Cold Creek Kush? Are you still growing that? I was looking at some of your old stuff. Oh man, um, unfortunately, I lost that cut last year outdoor. Um, hmm. I could not get. I I lost several genetics last year um, due uh, due to my one of my shade houses. I just. I, I kind of, a lot of my, some of my projects, I just, I let them go. And I when I'm testing genetics and doing stuff like that. I just kind of really put the plants through the ringer, um, especially with my genetics. And this is one of those things where I threw a few plants out to do a breeding project, a um, few moms, and just had the intention of taking cuts and all of that. And I had a, a shade house that started flowering like first week of July, which is like mm -hmm. a solid month earlier than I get that to happen here so i just kind of neglected it and by the time i was like holy shit these are these are like 10 days into flowering i couldn't get plants uh this cold creek kush specifically and lost a couple other genetics to reveg for me rewell so i bred i ended up breeding with it um i just let them flower out and then um i crossed it with uh, a gmo mac um male and when i tested all those man they're all Colombian. So there's like no Cole Creek gish in there at all. There's a little uh, bit like from the, like the structure a little bit, but there's nothing that is gas um, about it. And Cole Creek is, it's like SFV to me. It's one of the, the best OGs around. And unfortunately I don't have it. And the seed stock that I have, at least in that hybrid, I popped, I, I probably flowered out 24 females. They're all Columbia in okay. different levels of like haze, which is, not my style. Uh, you know, like I, yeah. I like to read for it. I like to release it. I like those sorts. I like me a 
you know, good Panama red or something, but I'm a sour Kim and no G smoker. So okay. super golden goat type Terps or Durban type Terps are just not really, they don't get me excited. So I got you. Damn, that sucks. Yeah, it always seems like there's always one that gets away from you. you know what I mean? There is, man. And being a breeder, it's there's so many. I mean, my stable's been everything that you could grow has been in my stable. And a lot of it, you know, I'll get through a breeding project with it. And I'm like, well, I'm not super impressed with this or, you know, whatever. And that doesn't get released. And then, you know, a lot of times I'm like, oh, I'll get the cut back, spread it out to a few people, let it go in my garden. And then 99% of the time, like go back to get it. And those people got russet mites or they killed the clone because, you know, of a problem in their garden or just not attentive in their gardens or whatever. So um, I feel like that shit happens. Genetics come, they go. It's, it's always unfortunate when you lose like that once, always that one that you don't take a cut of Yeah, that um, is going to end up being your favorite. And then fuck, it's gone for yeah, yeah. one jar of it. And that's it. <laughs> so let me go back a little bit then when you were, um, getting ready for that um that cup that you won with the fantasia yep so when you're prepping getting you know prepare for that and, and testing what did how many different fantasias were you working with or, or like having your buddies try or were you what was that process like till you figured out yes this is the one i want to enter or this is where i want to go well to be honest i'd already done all the testing um in i started doing all the testing in the fantasia in like 2015 um, okay. into 2016. I was working at a, a commercial facility here in Denver. So I was able to test huge populations of my, not huge, I should say. I don't, I don't make like a million seeds of a lot of my THC stuff. I mean, hemp, no problem. I'll make, I'm sitting on like 3 million hemp seeds right now, but I generally keep my stuff small batch, at least at first, um, do some outcrossing, see how the mail does and then, you know, work the lines a little more. So I started with, uh, 28 females, um, I think I popped 60 or something seeds, uh, maybe 70. Um, and it, there was a few runty ones and stuff in the original F1 that I didn't want to run with. So I ended up testing like 28 females. And then based on our test results and kind of what we saw in a commercial environment, I selected um, what I thought was by far the best one. And then I was just growing that at home because I love to smoke it. Um, and, you know, year and a half goes by or whatever. And I have my, my keeper that I've had in the stable. It just happened to, I didn't plan for this cup. Like I'm going to grow this to enter. It was like, okay, this is the harvest that's fitting in the window of like when I have to enter. Um, so what of this, uh, of this flower round is going to be the best. And there was a few other things that, you know, some OGs in there, like I probably could have done some work with the SFV, you know, and like impress some people with some of the OG Kush. Cause that's, you know, I'm, I worked for Pink House for years. We were the OG capital. We had every kind of OG Kush that you could have in Colorado, and people knew about us. So I learned growing with OG Kush. So I was like, oh, maybe, maybe one of these. And I just liked the Fantasia. And I liked the idea that uh, entering something that I bred. And it was one of the things that I was like, I think this can compete. And just so happens it did. Um, but it wasn't like a, it wasn't a planned out thing. I didn't like select a bunch of phenos so that I could enter the one that I thought was the best. It's like, I already had my keeper and it just happened to work out. That was, I had some of the flower around that fit the, the time frame, which is and what happened the second year too. And it didn't work out. <laughs> I didn't right. Work. Right. I, I did not win. So what you Marco, say, Brian? Back, back in the day, there's this thing called looping here in Denver. And basically what you would do is you'd go buy an ounce, uh, purchase it, go out, hustle it to somebody that wasn't able to go into the store and then go back in. You know, that's why it was called looping. Pink House uh, at, at w one time uh, was really known for that uh, because of certain individuals that were farming, you know, pumping out quality stuff. So when this really first came on board, it was really easy for your, you know, your average person to link up with a dispensary, have just a duffel bag, walk into the back office and make sales like that. And so even when they shut that down, it still kind of carried over. So that's where the the looping came from. And the pink house was one of those beacons, if you will, when people would drive into Denver uh, to get that done. And you could do that. You know, you could be here for a week and loop uh, and, and actually come come through with a, a pretty good amount of cannabis, especially if you had a little team. So uh, mm -hmm. just again, I wanted to give the accolades where they, where they belong, man, because not yeah. only was he winning cups, but, you know, the the, the streets, if you will, definitely know what bring people back. So if, if they're going out of their way to go to the dispensary, uh, where he's farming uh, right. you know again it speaks for itself 
Yeah, the streets, the streets don't lie. They're gonna tell you what's hot. You know, we were talking about that before. They're always gonna go back to well, wh where's that other stuff? You know what I mean? If you don't, <laughs> you don't have it. But um, yeah, it's pretty dope. And then um, Bioflux. I see that was another one of your strains. Or was that just kind of something you were a breeding project? Yeah, actually, um, a good friend of mine made that one. Uh, my buddy Jeff, um, okay. Johnny Find a Seed on Instagram. He took my, I made the Slime Flux, which is the male um, in that cross. And uh, he just popped some Slime Flux and selected a male out of there. Had a, a biohazard, I think it was a bag seed, um, but it was incredibly good flower. And he tossed the Slime Flux on there. Made a handful of seeds, man. I bet he made no more than like 30 or 35 seeds, tiny little plant, you know, and, um, and he gave me most of them and I selected through them and dude, every one of the, every one of the strains was fire. You know, I only popped like 10 seeds or something. And the, the four females that I got were incredible. And I selected one of them. And then, I mean, it just, it performed everywhere. It's, it performed being beat to hell in my tester tent. It crushed it outside full sun. A lot of the stuff on Instagram, you can see like that's, you know, that's full sun flower, um, you know, no greenhouse, no depths, no cover. And it is, it, it's gorgeous and smokes so good. I'm like, yeah, it looks I, amazing. I, I had to do a double take, not to cut you off, but I had to do a double take. I'm like, damn, this is, this is outdoor. I was like, my man right? is doing it nice. So yeah. performs super well. Um, so I brought it in. Um, it's actually, uh, we can, I can just tell you the story now. It's a, it's a nice little failure story that I can talk about. I brought that one in because I was so impressed with it. Um, I was like, I'm going to fem these. I've done a lot of feminine projects in the hemp game and just never really focused on the THC side of making feminized seed. I'm like a traditional breeder in that respect, but a lot of people, you know, they want to plant 50,000, hundred thousand seeds. It's a lot easier to do that um, than clones. So in the hemp game, just them it, sell it, um, you know, the seeds, obviously test them and everything, but you can, you can put a lot of, uh, a lot of seeds out in a short amount of time. You don't have to deal with cloning propagated stuff. Either way, no THC fems in my lineup or in my, uh, on my menu. It's not something I've done. Um, or there's a conductor shot right there. It's a good strain. Um, the, the bioflux though, I decided to fem it. I was like, I want this specific phenotype. Um, I want to self it. And then I want to see what some outcrosses will do. You know, I want to hit a, hit the sour again, hit some chems. There's, you know, I have a plan with that. So, uh, femmed it, collected all sorts of pollen, man. Shit tons. 45 days of growing that plant. Pollinated um, my garden two weeks ago, basically filled up for seeds. Pollen is sterile. <laughs> there is no, uh, I don't think a single, I'm not seeing a single red hair. And I mean, I dumped, like there's a lot of pollen. I dried out my room. It's not a humidity thing. I just literally think, the the pollen is sterile so um i'll have to try again try a different method maybe instead of the for feminization there's a few that i have in my sleeve so this what do one, you do silver uh, i usually do colloidal silver only because i get full reversals <coughs> and dude, silver nitrate and sodium thiosulfate like it's shit i mean sodium nitrate mainly that shit's hella toxic it's not safe to handle i don't want to spray it in my garden you know like i don't want it around me you know it's like it works but it's uh it has its place but it's not something that I'd, yeah, I'd rather just spray colloidal silver on the plant i mean people eat colloidal silver for for health and um you know it's relatively safe i mean the high concentrations that i'm using it to to get it to reverse is definitely not safe for human consumption but I mean, ultimately, it's uh, it feels more natural to do as stupid as it sounds, feminizing something or selfing something as being natural. It just seems um, safer um, to me. So I do that. And I've had better results uh, with colloidal silver consistently um, giving me full res reversals and not just like, uh, you know, a handful of male flowers or, you know, kind of a hermaphrodite looking plant. Um, so hey, Greg, you know, that's, I, yeah, I had that in my notes today, buddy, if we could, uh, kind of talk about what colloidal silver, uh, does to the plant. And then if you could kind of just a one oh one kind of step-by-step -step process on what you do so that more individuals can kind of understand why that might be important compared to, uh, other methods. Yeah. I mean, if we want to go there now, again, while we're talking on it, um, you know, I think, I think I will say this for growing in general um if it works for you and you can you have a system that works then 
don't let anybody tell you that this is better. Um, you know, there's obviously proof one way or the other on some certain things, depending on what we're talking about. But for real, people that want to use STS and they get full reversals and it and it's amazing. I'm I'm never gonna try to convince this person to switch over to colloidal silver. I don't have a beside from me personally not wanting to handle silver nitrate or you know spray this stuff around when I have pets and you know a living soil system like um, I know silver nitrate if I douse the plant um, it's probably not doing good things for any of the soil biology um, at least on the surface and then when I water it in who knows um, I will say silver is a heavy metal so same kind of thing but I know um, I just choose it because it worked um, for me when I tried all the methods and a few years ago um, and that was pretty pretty much the sole reason why I stuck with it is because I can make it work and I can get full reversals no matter what. So I'm not like super emotionally invested one way or the other, but um, I do know colloidal silver, you know, it's um, it's kind of hard on the plant STS2. I'm not I'm not entirely sure the mechanism um, of like blocking ethylene to then like kind of confuse the plant into um, switching sex. Um, I know STS uh, achieves this in a different way than colloidal silver does. It seems to me the colloidal silver, and I'll admit I haven't done a whole lot of research on this, this like exactly the method, it seems to me it clogs, um, it like clogs the plant, um, not like the stomata or something. I mean, that's so, if you don't have serious concentration then it won't um uptake it but the silver seems to um just stop the plant from uh producing i, I think i'm saying this wrong either producing ethylene or start blocking ethylene um to then change to a male all i know is that it works and so i'm doing it now i'm i need to now that i've this is my first sterile pollen situation i do need to get myself more versed about the exactly why this is happening because I maybe it was the colloidal silver itself, the concentration or whatever I did that in this particular plant made the pollen sterile, you know. So I want to try STS. I want to figure out some more kind of the details on the um, the physiology of why this is happening. Um, safe to say it's um, there's other methods too, you know, gibberellic acid and um, light stressing and kind of old school techniques that also work for making them seeds so um yeah yeah definitely man and i'm just going to take it back even you know just for for some folks that even you know don't know the basics so let's just say this is the scenario right i got a nice female right and i want to keep that lineage going so i want to take one of those females and now i want to turn turn it into a male so i can get the pollen is that the kind of where we're going with the silver and then now when i take that pollen i can reverse you know pollinate back and, and continue that breeding correct all right so okay yeah just just want to put that out there just so everybody understands kind of what we're talking about um we're, we're trying to take a plant that's a female get some pollen off of it so more or less you're stressing it um you know everybody talks about herms or you get a light leak or something like that well that's more of a hit and miss Whereas um, adding the silver, the colloidal silver, and some people actually swear by that, like as a dietary supplement. So it is something that people do consume in their bodies, like anything else. Do your research. Um, you know, like you said, you don't want to do it too much of anything. Um, but yeah, just giving you all the basics on that. And if you did go to the extreme, oh. you'll turn blue. <laughs> you'll turn blue or purple. Yeah, I am plugged that mic there. Uh, yeah, so ob obviously things in moderation, but um, uh, so when you're doing the colloidal silver, is it is it something that is kind of like a how, like how long of a process is that for you? Well, I'll tell you what. When I first started doing it, I was I was under the impression that you had to spray much more frequently than you actually do. So um, I know with STS, uh, you spray a couple of times pre flip. Like maybe within the you know the two weeks before, and then maybe you have to apply one or two more times um, within your you know say seventeen day window um, before flowers are like super super set and you can really see whether your reversal worked or not. So STS you got to spray less frequently. I was always under the impression that you make colloidal silver fresh every day and you spray it fresh 
every day. Um, for, I mean, I've had plants that haven't started dump pollen until day 30 of flower. So um, you do the math. That's, that's a lot of uh, labor comparatively. But turns out um, and you don't have to spray it as much. <laughs> but the, the process generally takes four to six weeks. Um, depending on how you do it, if you're counting the two weeks before flower that you may want to start inoculating your plant and then up to depends on the strain. I mean, I've seen strains that start dumping pollen at day 12. I've had other strains that just don't want to reverse and it's like, I'm pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And then finally day 30 to day 35, I start to get pollen dump. So, um, it's very, very strain specific. And um, just in my observations, it seems that plants are that are more maybe prone to hermaphroditic um, intersex tendencies are easier to reverse. Seems like they may not take as much to to flip over, um, which is my technical term for <laughs> turning a female into a male. But either way, uh, the the strain very much um, plays into uh, how much work you got to put into it to get it to reverse. Okay. By reverse, I mean, um, you know, you can do it, you can do it both ways, you know, I guess to, to clarify on that, you can, okay. um, you can spray a male plant, and you can turn it into a female, there's some strategies out there about doing that so that you can see potentially the trait, um, or traits that this male would pass in its female offspring. Um, I don't know that that's true, because it's, you're not taking into inheritance when you, um, when you reverse a male, you know, if you outcross that, like, just because it has the trait in the male doesn't mean you'll see it in the progeny. But um, either way, I've heard of people reversing males so that they can see, uh, you know, a uh, a trait or something that maybe is associated with um, the female. Um, and then obviously the other way around when people talk about feminized seeds or S1s or S whatever uh, number of generations or gynecious plants, you know, we're talking about reversing um, a female plant to collect male pollen, um, that just doesn't have the male gene. And then all of the offspring are female when you pollinate with that. So, um, okay. yeah. Um, so when you, so when you, um, so, so Greg, when you take a female, right. So say I got pl uh, Fantasia, right. Yep. So I took Fantasia. Now let's say I, I have two Fantasia cuttings. I've got one, I'm, one's a female, one I'm going to reverse. Yep. All right. So let's say I reverse that one and I use that pollen back on the original one. Does that produce feminized seeds as a self plant would? Because it that, started the same pollen? That's well, what? I mean, that's truly what an S1 or what a self plant is. Is like if I take two, you know, I have my mother plant of Fantasia. I take two clones from the same plant. I reverse one, collect pollen, and then put it on that second clone. That is, that's how you make self S1 okay. version. So that's I thought the self was only when you get that random one seed and, you know, in a feminized flower, you know, I thought it could that be good. that it could be that, you know, but a lot of times if you get a full reversal, you know, you, and you can play around with this, so, you know, I encourage people to, um, if you're making seed or you want to play around with something like that, like, you know, reverse a branch on the same plant. You know, only spray one plant or one branch on a plant and and see what happens. And oftentimes, if you're real careful with your spray, um, you will produce male pollen um, in a segregated area of the plant. And then you can actually do a self. It's it's the same if it's clonally propagated. But, you know, you can actually pollinate the, the whole plant itself. You know, um, your original mother, you know, making male and female parts on it. And that's mm -hmm. truly when a plant is hermaphroditic it is selfing also. So um, like if your, your plant herms and um, it pollinates itself, um, that the, all those seeds will be female always. So it's the same thing, you know, just depending on, you know, is this an intersex prone plant or did I, you know, in, induce this, uh, this state with colloidal or whatever, you know? So yeah, if you, if you take your, um, your pollen and you hit it on the same plant, that's a self plant. And then if you cr outcross that to other 
plants, you know, same thing. It's going to be, it's going to all be female seed. There isn't, um, there isn't the gene to make males. I mean, nature finds a way. So you'll, you'll see every 4,000 seeds or 10,000 seeds, you'll get a male, even in a thin batch, no matter how good your process is. But, uh, you know, seems to work. What do you, sorry, I couldn't click the button right. Uh, what can you kind of describe for the audience what the difference is between like an S1 versus an F1? Uh, I know we briefly talked about it, but I, I guarantee you most of our audience might not have heard that until today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's basically F1s or F, you know, whatever. A, a true F1 is um, two parental lines, P1s technically, um, your parental lines, and then you combine them, cross them together. So I cross um purple fantasy with platinum tesla so those are my two parental lines i cross those together and i get fantasia now that's an f1 so when you make regular seed as in you use the male and you use the female um those are those are f lines f1s um if you used true breeding parents <clears throat> and then as you go down you make your f1 my fantasia now, if I grow out those plants and I find a male and a female from that um, group of F1 seeds and I cross those together, then I make F2s. And as you go down the line, it's it's true breeding actual males and females. So F1 through F12 just shows you how inbred, a way of showing how inbred your line is. Um, and then same thing with back crosses. Back crosses are an inbred line, but it's going from say an f1 generation so i cross kerbal fantasy with platinum tesla make fantasia i select a female or a male doesn't matter um, it goes both ways um, and pick uh, a plant from that f1 generation and then i cross it back to one of the parents um let's just say kerbal fantasy then that would be your your bx and then you do that pop those seeds cross it back to the original Kerbal Fantasy parent again, you get your BX2s and then on down the line. So it's just a, a different way of, um, of inbreeding. And it stabilizes your strains when people talk about stabilizing genetics. And there's all sorts of reasons to back cross, uh, depending on what your, um, what your F1 generation looks like. So true breeding like that, F1s, back crosses. Now, if you want to make S1s, now S1s are selfed. Um, and so you cross your, you know, you take your female, you make it into a male, collect your pollen, throw it on itself. Then you have an S1. And then if you pop those seeds, do the same thing again, either find a female and then collect pollen, throw it on itself. Then you have an S2, or you can back cross it, collect the pollen, kind of do the same thing, but they're all S lines. I'm not sure. I don't know the like what you would call a, a self like back cross or right, feminized. Right. It's just, I just call it a feminized back cross. Cause it's not really self anymore. And you're kind of, I mean, you're making like it's a back cross, but it's all female, you know? So either way, that's, that's kind of the difference. F ones are made are regular seeds. S ones are feminized seed self, if you will. So there's lots of terminology going around about R like R1s and R2s and stuff like that. And I think that's just the same thing. I think that just means a reverse plan. I think it's just kind of a different way of saying the same thing that may or may not be scientifically recognized. I don't know. <laughs> hmm, as long as we're on the same page about what we're talking well about. Well explained. Like... <laughs> yeah, very well. So real quick on that same line of thinking, um, you know, I've, I, I've bred um, dogs a little bit in the past. And if obviously when you want to strengthen those lines with hunting dogs or whatever, um, so you strengthen them to a certain point. And then you can't strengthen but so much without bringing in fresh blood. Um, that's animals. How is it for, you know, plants, hemp, cannabis, when you really start, you know, a lot of heavy inbreeding, does it become detrimental or do you kind of just keep improving as you go? Um, yeah, if you inbreed a line, there, there comes a point where it will lose all of its, you know, what you talk about being hybrid vigor. Mm -hmm. And it will, you will get something that is very, very true breeding in the sense that like, you get to like a F12 or something, um, that plant probably is going to be beat to shit 
you know, like it's, it's probably not going to clone very well. It's probably, you know, just not going to be the healthiest. You're going to start losing yield numbers. And, you know, this, this is not all the case, but just as an example, you know, once you get real deep into, uh, um, into your inbreeding lines, you start to lose the strength and, um, all the vigor that you would have in the, in the earlier generations. So yes, yeah, so you either got to hybridize it, um, with something else, um, or, uh, which is the best way to do it. And then select again through that F1, um, because likely in that F1, I mean, obviously it's 50, 50, but inheritance wise, if you're in an F12, you're guaranteed that that plant is going to pass on whatever genetics it, it has to pass. Um, you're going to see them. It's going to be very, very true breeding and probably very, very predictable if you've been paying attention for the whole time you've been breeding it or whatever, but, um, it's a good place to start hybridizing, you know, cause you start hybridizing F ones and then F ones with other F ones and then F ones with other F ones. And then you start inbreeding those lines. It, the genetic potential is insane. So you start, you, there's no uniformity whatsoever. So, you know, you back cross long enough or, you know, just inbreed in general long enough, you'll get very, very predictable progeny. And then you'll get, you know, very uniform progeny. So, you know, that, of um, the 24 females that you're flowering, like just only going to be very subtle differences in whatever it is you're selecting for. It sounds like what I've been noticing too, man, is uh, folks like yourself and the, you know, people that know, that know what they're doing, they do that to a certain point, strengthening their line. And then they they're testing along the way. So they find that point where, boom, that's kind of my keeper. That's that one I can kind of, cross with everything and still keep those certain traits you know what i mean um exactly. is that is that kind of the idea behind it yeah and that's you know a lot of what i've done as well luckily i have a lot of luck too you know there's a lot of luck in breeding and when you're um when you're selecting phenotypes um there's a reason that a lot of you know some of the most amazing plants are out there or, you know bag seeds there is um there's certain, you can just hit certain combinations. It takes a very long time to be able to breed, you know, say I have nine strains or nine lines or whatever you want to call them. And it takes a very, very, very long time for you to be able to, to say with confidence and with scientific kind of backing that this is going to breed this into whatever you're going to cross it with. Um, and also I can guarantee that you're going to see x y and z in the you know in the progeny you got to get like well past the f3 f5 you know before you start seeing real predictable stuff and then it's all at that point past the f2 it's all it's all the breeder's fingerprint man you know if you can select at that point you've you've pushed the line in one direction or other i don't care if you're even popping if you're popping five thousand seeds and big populations of seeds like by the time you're in the f3 and f4 like you have selected artificially your uh whatever it is you're going to push down the line so um for me i like kind of goes you know a little off topic but i i like to release f1s and f2s um for folks that want to pheno hunt now that people that are just buying packs that want to like i want to find that winner the best thing you're going to have to find that winner is to to pop a whole bunch of f2s um and you're going to see all the combinations that you could get with those genes for the most part, it really splits open at that point. F1s are pretty easy. Like if you have good parental lines, you're going to find keepers in F1 packs. It's, um, it's just once you start breeding those lines, then she gets maybe really interesting, but F2, I like to release because people like to pheno hunt and that's the deal. But if I'm trying to grow acreage and I want, I know I need a half acre of cookies or whatever. I need a half acre of Fantasia, you know, you want to be giving people like F4 or stuff that are much more uniform and is um, just sellable in the same lot. You know, you're not getting wild enough variation to where, uh, you know, things get confusing for distribution or whatever. But I get what I'm you're saying. <laughs> no, no, I get what you're saying because even I, I did a little eight pack and they were each a different pheno. But they all had that same smells and they, they looked similar enough to where, like, you know, like you said, they could all kind of go together and it'd be the same, you know, same yeah. product or yeah. whatever you want. And that's what you hope as a breeder, you know, and that's kind of a, you know, goes both ways. It's like I want to give people enough genetic diversity and variance in the packs, you know, obviously the more packs you, you pop, 
the better likelihood you're going to find outstanding individuals or, you know, what we call keepers or, you know, just very strange recessive stuff that you're like, wow, I could take this in a direction that no one's ever gone, you know, but you got to pop a lot of seeds to do that. But I like in as a breeder, I like to offer packs that will give the pheno hunter like the excitement, like they're feeling like, okay, I mean, if you know the strain and you pop 12 seeds and you flower six females, and they all look exactly the same. It's like, oh, okay, well, I don't really have to select anything. It's, you know, if that's what's the fun part of it is like, oh man, like which one do I want to, which one do I think is the best? Like me, not, you know, anyone else. And then what do I want to do with that? And that's where just it's the genetic potential is endless for all these lines of anybody that wants to be a breeder. It's like you, you actually can be, you know, and you start to look at, you know, genetic and kind of DNA analysis. And I think a lot of these strains are a lot closer than um, genetically than what they are, but uh, than what we think they should be. I mean, and, but the fun is in the hunt. So um, I like to, I like to try to offer that to people. And I think anyone that pops seeds is going to want that too. <laughs> right. Do you have a website or anything like it's, that? Or it's, uh, it's currently under construction right now. I'm, um, I'm going to be at the, quick plug i'll be at the secret stash um here in denver it's uh it's groovy gravy on instagram dude throws a really amazing seed event um, i wasn't able to attend last year but this is kind of like the who's who of breeder it's like maybe since indo expo is not really happening anymore i don't think i feel like don't quote me on that but um it's definitely hasn't happened the last few events um i feel like this is going to be the new genetic event where people want to go get seeds from the hottest breeders and the new drops and everything, they're going to want to fly out to the secret stash. So um, point being, I'll, um, I'll, I'll be there. And uh, I, for, I totally forgot what you had asked me. My apologies. Well, yeah, I was just asking <laughs> how to get a hold of your stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, that's, yeah, I'll be, I'll be launching the website directly after that event. Um, I have a feeling I'm going to get swamped. And for a small time breeder, I want to make sure that i have enough stock and for all the heads that are going to be at that event i want to make sure get that I have it. so um <laughs> i, I my my website which is uh, where's the seed.com will be officially launched um probably the day after the event but i'm i'm my it girls literally my wife is working on it right now um as we speak so i will definitely have a uh, um genetic all the all the good stuff available online um yes. and um at least before then people will be able to check out my menu um and strain descriptions and kind of all that stuff or what i have available um probably in the next week um as of right now for anyone that wants to get a hold of you know any of my genetics or whatever you just hit me on ig um and, no don't do that you know, don't i just i mean like okay well i'll give you my email address they read be it. better um yeah, yeah. i don't want just, your shit to just, get deleted bro well, just hit me up there and then I can direct you towards, you know, yeah. email, but whatever. Yeah. My, my email is Greg at genomalchemy.com. Yeah. So, hit him up in the email so that he doesn't lose his shit. Yeah. It's been, talking prices been, it's been tricky lately. Instagram is not a great platform for anything cannabis related at the moment. Everyone's. Yeah. 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 And that's why those platforms are important. The, the, the gentleman that put on um, Indo Expo, he, he passed away last year. Uh, so when you're mentioning like there needs to be new events, Secret Stash is uh, definitely, I think, going to be one of those events. I was able to go last year hanging out with uh, Robbie with Nerds Genetics. Uh, and it is kind of cool to see new new farmers being able to ask certain questions, you know, because a lot of some of those seeds are not, you know, you're traveling across the country and then you're putting in, you're probably putting in some thousand, you know, a couple thousand dollars if you really uh, coming out and kind of maybe getting the best ROI for that. So, uh, if you've Definitely. never been to that event, go check it out for sure. And I, I see over here, um, let's see, there was someone asking in the chat over here about, uh, purple fantasy or purple fantasy. It's yeah, purple. loyalty. It's purple. It's purple fantasy. Um, was the, was the strain, the old school, um, old man perps, um, crossed with OG. Um, it was kind of a, it was purple fantasy was the like famous, strain here in colorado for a while the can of sewer and a bunch of places had it and it's just i describe it as purple gas it is literally like i it's the most unique and some of my favorite weed ever so there's no 
there was no chance I was letting that one go without putting in some crosses. And um, I've since lost the cut, but it's uh, it's around. Natty Rims OG. If you guys know Natty Rims in Colorado, Natty Rims OG is Kerbal Fantasy. So I don't want to. I'm letting the cat out of the bag. There it is. But it's, uh, Look, everybody's uh, writing. Everybody's writing stuff down. Right? <laughs> but yeah, the um, the Kerbal Fantasy is what I used in uh, um, in my Fantasia cross to answer loyalty organics question. But that Fantasia is available, going to be definitely, and that's all in your line. So when you start releasing, we can get hands on that. Easily. Oh, yeah, it's, it's been released. Fantasia has yeah. been available. It's, uh, I have F2s right now. I actually have two different versions of the F2, but I'm only releasing or have only released the, um, the Home Growers Cup, um, Cup crossed with my selected mail from Fantasia. Um, I made another version that um, I selected a green, the, the Kerbal the Fantasia that won the Home Growers Cup. Um, had this you know, kind of beautiful purple hues. Um, I selected a green variety out of the same lot of seeds that didn't have any purple at all. Um, and I made a kind of a green line of the, of the Fantasia as well. And I'm, in testing, it's been amazing. I haven't released it yet though. So um, either way, Fantasia is available right now. Um, you can get that from me. The F2s are available um, and whatever quantity people need. I probably have... I don't know. I probably got 10,000 of those seeds at the current moment. So um, they're super available. Um, and it's been outcrossed. A bunch of my outcrosses are available with the Fantasia as well. Very nice. Very now, nice. Greg, since you've been, you know, you, you definitely have an eye for this. You know, you're selecting certain things. Um, a great question I've heard a lot, several times is, have you ever found any benefit to holding on to a mutant or a runt where, you know, it just didn't look like it was going to perform. And then at some point throughout its life, it just started to, uh, you know, show, show its true expression and actually become something of value or do mutants and runs usually just kind of taper off like they, like they look. Um, I think there's good benefit to it. I generally, for me, um, when we talk about mutants, I'm thinking kind of like, um, like an OG Kush breath or kind of those weird duck foot leaves, something that veg is super slow, you know, has kind of very unique traits in the way that the plant structure is. Um, and th like, that's just what I think of when I think of mutants and, you know, generally I don't have good luck with those. Um, and I, my selections, I want as vigorous, vigorous plant as possible in veg. Um, now I've come across some very unique and somewhat recessive traits in flower that um that i think are beneficial you know and get some stuff you know just all of a sudden i think duke talked about this too that you have these predictable duke diamond that you you predict you have these predictable smells in certain lines and all of a sudden you do an outcross and it's like just off the charts like what where did this come from this is disgusting or amazing or both or whatever um and i think a lot of those recessive kind of mutant maybe genes i'm i'm I don't have DNA analysis, so this may not be the correct term for all this stuff, but, uh, you know, the, the outliers, um, I find are beneficial in like smell and oftentimes flower structure. Um, you can get some really interesting shit with just like the shape of the bud or the way it grows. But I find like any sort of vegetative mutant or anything that's like, doesn't have, it's not banging out the gate, you know, um, that's not really something I continue in my breeding projects. Not that they don't have benefit, but it's not, it's generally, those are the first ones that are getting cold <laughs> in my garden. <laughs> Life's all about finding the outliers, man. Indeed. A variety of Indeed. I like to give the run a chance too, man. I had, um, got some stuff tested, had a little run in there and, um, the test results came back inconclusive and they said, well, let you know next week. So I just hung on to it and the run actually ended up being a female, so I'm growing it out. So I think that's pretty cool. But I like what you said about the mutant stuff. I probably wouldn't prefer to keep that in my stuff either because you kind of got that um, roll of the dice. You know what I mean? If you're really trying to tighten in on something and you kind of throw in that mutant, you never know what you get. Now, I will say if you're um, if you're just popping seeds and, you know, you're not trying to breed with it or something like there's no reason like I if I'm just hunting for clones, you know, I'm searching for clone only stuff in my genetics. It's not something that like maybe a line, like I hit a dead end or something and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to pop a few and see what I, what I can find. I don't plan on breeding with anything. I'll flower off every individual, you know, even if I can't get that shit to grow at all, you know, and it's this tall in the pot, you know, I'm curious, you know, I don't have 
Um, I don't have a lot of money to do testing and stuff like that, but I think there might be some cool stuff in there when you start testing cannabinoid profiles or um, certain things like that, compounds that are in the plant. Um, I have no doubt that some of those weird little plants probably do some cool shit in that area, but um, I'll flower them off. I'll give them a chance, but a lot of those ones like that, they're just, they're not worth keeping in my breeding. And um, so I don't keep them. Now you had mentioned, um, you know, you got to start somewhere. Uh, and I, I like to ask this question to a variety of our uh, guests. Who do you look to genetics wise um, when you're, when you're starting stuff out that you might not necessarily have the genetics yourself. So are there certain tried and true uh, breeders that you would shout out, uh, especially if they're maybe um, not as well known? Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I will admit that um, the last at least five or six years, uh, I don't pop a lot of stuff outside of my gear only because I'm like, I make 60 strains and I can only grow flower off 12 plants at a time. Um, it gets complicated and I, my, I have to make use of my, my square footage the best that I can. But I will say I always pop archive gear and I always pop Karma Genetics gear. Um, those are not small time breeders by any means, but, um, I, there's never been a time where I've popped packs that I wasn't like, wow, this shit's amazing. Um, at every time. So those are my go-to. I'm like, if you're just, they're not cheap either, but Hey, I mean, if you want to grow from seed, you don't have access to clones. I would recommend both those breeders all day long. And if you're trying to grow for hash or just resin farming only, um, I mean, Bloom Seed Co is just, just everything is going to wash. Everything's going to be, um, going to be nailing it. Now I can't speak to stability. A lot of these genetics, I know I've never had issues with archive or karma. Um, but those three are just well-known dudes or folks or teams or whatever you want to call them that are, um, consistently bringing the heat all the time forever. Um, as far as small time breeders down with dirt um is one of my my go-to um unfortunately he just passed away um so like r.i.p my dude but if you can get any of his gear anywhere if it's in people's vaults swoop it up um because it's all amazing um everything we're down from dirt down with dirt is amazing um i like beyond hype seed co um sam's good dude and i think is he's making some cool super cool crosses um you know, he's relatively, you know, local Colorado dude doing his thing, um, working his lines. And I got nothing but respect for that. Nice. Yeah. You got anything, uh, bro? Think, uh, oh. Oh, bro, bro? Sorry, we were talking over each other. I, yeah. Archive is definitely uh, a, a brand that's tried and true. And um, I think secretly a lot of brands in Las Vegas are growing their genetics because uh, it's kind of hard to fuck up so yeah man it's just always good to hear from uh, somebody at your level man of of trying to take things to the next level for someone that wants to start out so it's like yeah you can get a clone from a from your buddy but we've talked about all the risks of that uh and then you know i think for most of us we want to find something that is our own or at least start out that way and that's something that you you know you just kind of carry that torch man for the you know kind of the smaller time farmer that's just really trying to make a name for themselves uh, without being too, too hype about it. Yeah. And I mean, that's the, that's the thing about my genetics too, you know, it's super, super affordable and you're going to find good stuff. You're not going to have to worry about your garden, you know, being ruined from herms or something. Although that shit happens, you know, it doesn't matter how good of a breeder you are. There is certain intersex traits and there's lots of environmental conditions that, are going to bring that out and that otherwise wouldn't show up in, you know, the most perfect of gardens. So that's going to happen with any breeder. It's anyone that's claiming hundred percent non-intersex, like, come on, like we're too, this plant is too diverse and um, there's so much genetic material. There's, it's just not a, it's not a guarantee, but regardless, you know, pick someone you trust. If you got a homie that's making seeds, like grow their gear, you know, like even, if it's never been grown before, you know, it's the fun of this. And it's, it's kind of like, 
if your angle is I need the most stable genetic and most hype genetic because I need to fill my garden and I need to sell product or whatever it is, um, I get that angle. But, if, you know, you just want to grow plants because you like growing cannabis and it's fun. And, you know, for all the, you know, the reasons that it's a it's a hobby and um, then like by all means, like pop those bag seeds, man, like ask your ask your parents if they have any swag, you know, like for the youngins, you know, like any or pop, anything, if, if you can get a hold of seeds, like grow them, you know, and then learn. And, um, obviously starting with the hottest material or stuff that's going to be smokable and sellable helps, but, um, it's fun to pop just random stuff sometimes. And, um, just whatever your angle is, you know, if you're, if you're growing to make money, like probably find someone with some cuts. And if you don't have cuts, then you know, obviously go with the known, known breeders because that's your, you know, it's potentially your bread and butter. It's like, I'll make a good business decision one way or the other, but you know, popping seeds and making seeds is fun. So pop seeds and make your own seed and then you don't have to buy them from anybody and then <laughs> work your lines. And it's like, you know, like just, just, just do the thing. And that's one thing I can tell young or newcomer growers. It's like, just don't be afraid to stay in your lane and don't be afraid to own um like whatever whatever it is you like uh, over whatever someone says you should like you know if you if you love a strain for whatever the reason then grow it and uh, i think social media and a lot of these hype things you know are are exactly that you know it's marketing so do what you love you love smoking that gary payton and find gary payton if you like smoking northern lights haze like I mean, I'm a sucker. I smoke Fort Collins cough all day. NL5 haze, the oldest, I mean, just ancient weed, you know, but I love it. It's in my jar. It's what I smoke every day. So, it's, you know, don't, um, don't be afraid to have your preferences and grow what you love. Um, don't have to ride the hype train all the time, you know? Like, let's say, you know, you are a newer farmer, you're setting up maybe a larger facility for you. So maybe it's the first time you set up, you know, you're going from a tent to a basement, or maybe you're going from a basement to like a, at least a decent building. You don't want to just grow the same clones that everybody else is growing. At what level do you feel like to get stability uh, is worth the investment, you know, going down genetics, the line of genetics, like, is it at like, what level do you think is worth the investment to where you can grow from seed uh, comparable to clone? And I know it's not apples to apples, but I, I hope I'm uh, qualifying. You mean like, question. you mean like what generation or like, like I want to grow. Take yeah. I, I want to grow. A, I want to uh, grow a variety of, of plants, but I, I really want to grow from seed. So I first want to kind of, instead of going just clone only, you know, maybe I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach and I want to grow all from seed, but yet I still need stability because I need to hit my numbers. I also want to grow, you know, to pheno hunt, but at the same time, I need to hit my numbers so that I can pheno hunt. Is there some level within that genetic line that you feel like is worth uh, the risk and the gamble of that? Yeah. And this is, this all has to do with the parental lineages, you know, like there's certain lines that they're not, maybe your parents aren't as true breeding for the things that you like about the strain, you know, or the, even the commercial viability of it, say um, just straight up bag appeal yield um, short flowering time, you know, the very like super kind of holy grails of if you want to turn and burn a commercial grow, you know, what you're looking for, you know, it's just maybe strain doesn't matter. You just, it's got to yield. It's got to look good. It's got to smell good. It's got to finish in eight weeks and um, preferably be easy to trim and, a quick vegger, you know, like <laughs> the, the kind of the goals there, but um, you can get that in even like F3 generations with, you know, where damn near everything is uniform. Um, and I don't want to say stable, but that I think with the terminology we're using is, is the same um, something that's going to be viable and not hermaphroditic. There's not going to be surprises in there. Um, certain genetics, you'll be able to get there in the F3, you know, other ones, you might have to go to the F6 or seven um, before you can really say with confidence that I've, I've bred out these, um, these bad alleles and are, sorry for the, you know, non-scientific people that we've bred out all the traits that we don't want. Um, it, sometimes it takes a while, 
you know, those, uh, those things will pop up in generations that they didn't pop up before. And then you're like, ah, oh, shit, you know, and then your selection becomes way more important as you move it on. And then, you know, you get to a point where it can be, like you said, you can pop these hundred seeds or 500 seeds and know that the half or so females that are going to come out are going to be pretty uniform. And you know, at least you don't have to worry about, you know, something bad happening and seeding out. And like, if you're, genetic wise anyway you know if your grows dialed then you should be good so it's very strain dependent i think that just the deeper you go in there the more predictable you know either bx3s you know bx2s bx3s those when you start back crossing that's what you should be look for if you're trying to do that style of grow i guess that's if while i'm talking out loud about it that's maybe the safest bet is to do like bx's because you know that the one parental lineage is every time you back cross it donating another 50 percent of the genes to the gene pool so you can pretty much expect by the bx3 that your seeds are going to look like whatever the parent the parent was that you were back crossing it to most of the time the female that like clone only mother that's like you bx something three times to it then you start to get something that is very much like the mother in seed form so but yeah. that takes some that takes some time too right that that uh, getting to that um bx3 um oh yeah I guess that could be done in some what couple of years or maybe less I mean, it depends on how you're doing if you're doing all outdoor of course it's gonna take you forever because you know right. bx3 is you know fourth generation because you got to make your f1s and then you you know bx it three hit it to the mother three more times you know if you're going outdoors that's four years you know if you're just strictly like you, you don't have a, a way to to do multiple generations in a year, you know, four years. But, you know, you could do it in if you were strict about it, um, you know, flowering cycle, say from veg to 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 end of flower will be, you know, 100, 100 days. You know, you can get four generations, 400. Days. You can get that done in a year and a couple of months. If you that's You're all, you, do, <laughs> you know, you could push it. Yeah, you literally. And, but you're not going to get true selections like that you know i guess if your goal is to literally just get as much of the parent into the genetic then you just kind of open i mean you, there's lots of strategies you could do to get there quicker you know but yeah it takes so, a long time it's if you're testing your gear you know mm -hmm. you got to grow it and you got to grow out your individuals and you select and then you cross it again and then you grow them all out you select and you know oftentimes i mean for me i don't release anything unless i grow it indoors and outdoors so I'm not going to make my selection on the female or the male that I want to um, back cross with for, you know, at least until I grow it twice. Um, so it's, you can see like working these lines, people that are, have worked seed lines and actually grow their own seeds and make their own seeds. This is like a lifetime investment kind of thing, you know. Mountain Organics, the guy makes um, botanicals too. He's another breeder that his lines are literally like the one and, you know, a couple of like crosses through that. And he's like, I have a lifetime of work here. Like just with these, like not outcrossing anything crazy, like just with these specific lines, he could grow them and breed with them and do all he needs to do within this short thing for the rest of his life. And that's that's no doubt. I have more seeds than I can ever pop in my whole life unless I get to a spot where I'm like popping 100,000 seeds at a time. You know, if I continue on the path that I am now, like I'll never get through these seeds. <laughs> like, well, exactly. Gotta, and that's why know? I like to ask those questions, man, to the breeders, because I, I, I love the vigor of youthful folks. And, you know, they get into something and they're all into it. But I just want people to understand that this, these things take time to actually develop. And my my Follow-up question to that is how important is it if I'm developing an outdoor strain to actually take the time and grow it outdoors at least once, twice, you know, or is it, do you get enough of what you need to know from if you grew that indoors? Your, you know, your opinion on that. Oh man. I mean, you gotta, you gotta test your genetic and the environment you're trying to breed it for. I mean, just straight up, if you're trying to grow, grow for a commercial environment, then you need to be able to test your genetics and select in the environment that you want it to grow in. So there's no, I mean, I, I see it constantly that my strains will crush in, you know, I, I, most of what I select for, it's got to crush in both, but I'll see significant differences between 
indoor growing and outdoor growing for the same strain in Colorado here in the climate that we have. Like outdoors, it's hard to grow weed outdoors here. It's so dry. The sun is so intense. You know, the there's no humidity in the air. I mean, it's the water's scarce, the soil's alkaline. It's it's hard. So if you can get something that crushes, if you're selecting for an outdoor strain, you got to grow it outdoors in very harsh environments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you got to select based on what does the best there. It's like same with vegetables and everything too, you know, like when I'm selecting and I save all my seed for my vegetables every year, I select the individuals that did the best in the worst conditions <laughs> in my yard. And you, and those are the seeds that I push to the next season. So same goes with cannabis. It's like, if you are going to select for, you want something that's just going to knock it out of the park in your four by four tent, you best grow it in your four by four tent. And same thing with outside too. It's you, you're never going to know how it's going to grow in a particular environment unless you actually do that. I don't think there's any way to assume that, um, you know, uh, aside, the only thing that can get close is if you have a dialed in greenhouse and an indoor environment, you know, sealed sort of systems. I think you can somewhat predict um, at least growth patterns and yields and stuff like that. Obviously you're going to get a quite different pro, pro uh, terpene um, and cannabinoid profile. Um, in sun grown versus, you know, whatever lighting you choose. Um, I, no matter what, that's going to be a different thing, but I think, you know, greenhouse grown in a sealed system versus indoor, I can make somewhat of predictions about what my genetics are going to do, but no way can I say, all right, it's crushed it in a sealed environment, greenhouse. What's it going to do outside? It's very, very hard to predict that sort of thing. Um, so you just got to select for that and actually for sure as important as it is grow it in that environment and just one more follow-up on that same line man so a part of your selection i'm sure also includes you know stressing like you said it's got you want to put out tough plants because you know someone may be growing your plant in an even tougher environment than you um and if you do that then when they're growing in an easier environment than you then the, the plant should even thrive even more now, I think that's that's a that's a valid assumption there, you know, for just a given environment. It's like I put like I said, I put my plants through the ringer, man. So one of my testing tents is literally like doesn't even zip up like the tents like I mean, it's falling apart. Zip tied. The thing is just a piece of crap. There's no environmental controls at all. Um, you know, the lighting, the light is nice in there. Like I have a really nice heliospectra light in there, but, um, you know, no, there's no humidifiers. There's, um, an exhaust fan that runs if it's were to get too hot, but rarely. Um, so it's like, I, I'm giving this plant light stress. I'm giving it abiotic stresses of every kind, you know, it's, it's hot in there. It's dry in there. I'm getting wild temperature swings from night and day. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, you know, it's big pots and living soil, but I don't have like blue mats or anything. So, you know, the watering schedule is wild, you know, I really kind of just let it do its thing. And, um, for the first time that I grow these plants and really what's most, um, important to me in my selections is that no matter what kind of weird stresses I can give it, that it doesn't herm out. Because when I talk to everyone in the community, this seems to be the, the thing that they're most concerned about and what just just gets everyone the most riled up is like, oh, this plant hermed, you know, and like, or maybe it pollinated my garden and all these things. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm giving it all the stresses, low light scenarios, interruption of the dark cycle, um, you know, all the stresses that I could think of that may cause it to herm out. Within reason, obviously, if I, I can't just like leave the tent open and it's got a flower, you know, it's going to do weird shit. But um, I definitely put them through the ringer so that I can be confident um, that if I release a cup. Uh, he'll probably pop back on here. There you go. You know, while, while we're waiting for him to come back. Uh, putting the plants through the ringer. I mean, that was something that uh, Duke gave a talk in Denver on. And, um, you know, he, he was basically explaining it like, all right, I, I, I have to cause so much stress because especially with someone's new, like, let's say that they over overfeed and over water uh, and then the plant herms out, they're still going to blame the breeder on that right. point. 
So that's why yeah. you know Duke, Greg, the other ones that are doing doing the work, you do kind of have to take it to the next level with your plants because uh, you never know how somebody's going to to grow. And then Duke was saying a lot of times, you know, people want their money back six months later because it wasn't. I mean, just kind of silly stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that's another thing, guys, like sometimes people complain about the seed prices and I get it. You know, some of them are high, but a lot of these prices have to do with the amount of work some of these guys put in. I know that, you know, every plant yields a shitload of seeds. We get that. Um, but the ones that are really putting in the work and their prices are up there. I mean, you know, if you think about it, it's going to be worth it. You find one keeper. I mean, you guys know once you got one, you got it. So you just can continue on. It's not like you bought something and you can never use it again. Um, so there is some value with getting spending good money and, and supporting these good these guys that do it the right way. Yeah. And I think an excellent way to look at it is, you know, you're buying somebody else's work. You're buying somebody else's beats, if you will. And then you don't really have to do that much. And then everybody else, unless you are honest and give credit where credit's due, are going to think that you did that, especially if you're in a newer market or maybe your peers don't understand, um, you know, how you know how most people get get their genetics. It's usually from someone else's work and then they never give credit where credit's due. So taking the yeah. time to uh, find out who the who the breeders are that you you, you know, that's why I always kind of ask some of the same questions to a lot of the breeders, uh, because then you, if you hear the same names time and time again, then I hope that that gives you more confidence to at least maybe go look for yourself and check out a brand that you've heard. Uh, I don't want to endorse anybody, but at the same time, I, I want to endorse individuals that it, that other people's opinions are, are on. And, and asking it that way, I feel like is, is such a better way than, you know, being the show is sponsored by this or that. Uh, it just always allows us to talk freely on what is uh, for you guys, you know, what is worth value and what is worth, you know, not and when it comes to seeds, doing your homework, especially so you don't spend, you know, at the beginning when the Indo Expo, Marco, I wish I could have showed you that, man. And here in Denver, it was like the Super Bowl. Mm. There were so many people that would go around, you know, spend, spend racks on seeds. Uh, and then they would continue to, you know, sell it on the East Coast and all that kind of stuff or just grow it out themselves. And they just always, in my opinion, had a strategic advantage over others. Uh, by going to some of these certain expos around the country, they were just able to get the genetics from the source, ask them the, whatever questions they needed from the source, uh, because at yeah. most of these big things, the, the breeders there, even Capulator, who's I don't know if everybody's familiar with him, but, you know, he he always wears gloves. He has a mask on. So most people don't even know what he looks like, uh, but he's actually in attendance there wearing the mask. So it just shows the. There, there is importance for the breeder to be able to explain things, even if that breeder doesn't want to be, um, you know, show their face. Yeah, a lot of them don't. Hey, he's, he's back. Good, good. This looks even clearer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. My computer. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All yeah. Right? Cool. Yeah, you, yeah look, my, my you look crystal just, clear, uh, man. <laughs> I know. My computer overheated and turned off, so um, I'm glad it came back on. So. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. <laughs> yeah, we're just talking about, man, just the importance of, um, you know, uh, we're just saying like, hey, spending money with people that are doing it the right way. And just once real quick, I want to shout out my buddy um, from Colorado, a Mile High Gardener with the um, dope quality shirt, which I um, was able to purchase from his website. And uh, just supporting good people, man. It's got the 5K and F principles on it. And um, I will have a sip of OHN on that note. Oh yeah, nice. <laughs> and um, yeah, man, just um, so we haven't really talked about how you how you garden, man, how you grow, how you farm, and I know it's all regenerative, living soil, and all that kind of stuff. But how's kind of your greenhouse setup, or um, you know, you long beds or big pots? Kind of what? Tell us about your setup. Um, so I mean, I'm in a I'm in a suburban neighborhood, so my greenhouse is um, not that big. I have a I have a ten by twelve foot greenhouse. That's got um, some of the like Harbor Freight ones, um, mm -hmm. you know, but it's really tall. Um, it's actually super like works well um, for a season extender. I didn't harvest anything in there as far as um, cannabis and hemp went last year until just before Thanksgiving. Um, mm -hmm. So like super late. That's like a solid month after um, or five weeks even after a lot of times we have to harvest here in Colorado. Um, and then I have vegetables growing in there. 
right now um direct seeded stuff not just transplants um mm -hmm. so it's warm enough now to where you know a lot of my cool season stuff is popping um mm -hmm. and germinating and that's uh that's pretty good for mid-march um here so um yeah. as far as uh i have a couple of beds in there all raised um i filled them with uh used 707 mix from shit five or six years ago um from a buddy's garden that he was just he's always throwing his soil away he was one of those dudes and uh you know clean chemistry in the um in the soil zone i wasn't worried about like some gnarly chemicals or anything from it but he definitely was like every cycle dump the pots new soil you know so i took all of his soil and i filled up um inside beds uh in the greenhouse um not very deep uh like foot maybe um i could go 18 inches but you know a lot of times i'm trying to trying to conserve head space um the more canopy <laughs> um space that i can have um above ground um and it's kind of compacted and the soil was weird so i decided to not go just straight in ground um plantings so i did raise beds in there and then i have a so it's kind of like around the perimeter so if you picture like a horseshoe around the square yeah. and then i'll um i'll run big pots um right down the middle um i could put 60 gallon pots um i can do like six of them right down the middle um or five of them and still be able to get on either side um yeah, without so much so at that and then i have a i have a 10 by 20 um hoop house super rudimentary um just uh you know pvc um i do the conduit um just a little pro tip for people don't get the white pvc if you're going to build hoop houses um get the gray like conduit because it'll connect together and it's uv protected mm. so a lot of times if you're growing with the white pvc after a few seasons that shit'll get brittle you'll bump into it and it'll, your hoops will snap or something or your connectors will snap um go with the gray <laughs> all yeah, day great point. it's got the uh, male female end on the gray too yeah right? it does it does yeah. so you don't gotta you don't gotta buy the connectors you're gonna fuck around with any glue or anything you know it's kind of just it works good and um i haven't had them snap at that point but um yeah so i got a 10 by 20 um hoop house that uh, is just um I'm, i've always just had it covered it's been a shade house traditionally um and then i can pull plastic over it real easy um, this year, I think I'm going to add some wiggle wire to it and, um, inflate it and put a little wet wall in there. I have all the materials and everything. I just need to kind of install it. Um, it's kind of traditionally just been a high tunnel with cover over it, but I think I'm gonna put some end walls up and, um, inflate some poly and kind of, um, make it a little more than just a PVC hoop. A little more and, indoors. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Just a little more protection, something that I can, my goal would be if I'm, I got a lot of things on the on the horizons right now, but if I'm going to be here in Colorado for another winter, um, I want to be able to have an all winter greenhouse rocking. So, um, and just this is cheap and easy, and I have the materials already. You don't have to go spend money on a kit. So, um, that's, that's kind of that's that's kind of my at least my greenhouse operation. I have um, you know my basement, obviously. Um, have a you know a bunch of breeding tents and stuff like that and then all this is all um all living soil um i definitely do some container gardening smaller containers inside um just for uh for ease of being able to move them if i want to pollinate them or something versus having you know i'm not trying to move a 30 gallon pot um full of soil wet or 60 gallon or whatever um and i don't have beds inside um and then everything else that's full outdoors is all hugo culture um everything all around even my raised beds that i built outside i kind of did you know some hugo layering um in there and um so you know like brian said my front yard is full on uh farm <laughs> i usually do a huge three sisters planting right in the front so i got you know corn squash and beans rocking like the first thing you see you know about a bunch of vertical stuff so i got climbing stuff all around and um all that is all kind of hugo culture beds no dig um you know i i've had to till a few times when i installed um my in-ground beds obviously i don't d do anything with the raised beds but um just to kind of help build it a little bit i had to do some um some kind of strip tilling and incorporating some more organic matter into the straight clay and that was my yard um but now after i've been here for nine years 
So after just building soil for multiple seasons, then I don't have to till anymore. Um, so I don't till anything around the yard um, or for any of the vegetable. And um, same thing with my living soil pots and stuff inside. I don't dump any of the root balls. I just cut them at the surface and replant right next to the old root ball. Um, just makes it easy. There's no waste for me. And um, obviously I'm playing a lot of guessing here. I'm an intuitive gardener. I don't, uh, I don't get a lot of soil tests um, <laughs> me either. For, for inside, you know, um, I just, uh, I'm like, I can adjust how I need. And kind of most of my 30 gallons are pretty much set. They're built um, here. I'm going to have to go through there's like four of them that i have to dump now because it's pretty much all worm castings mm -hmm. so it's, i have to when they're fully watered it's like it, it just it water, water once every two weeks and i'm like it's just not it's a little much so i need to split them up and use those as kind of the compost yeah um, cut them in half to what's yeah, exactly. oil, you'll, you'll be you'll be kicking there yeah yeah exactly get my aeration back up <laughs> yeah nice man yeah yeah guys just listening to um greg talk listening to you talk man i love it because I love when someone grows multiple plants. You got to grow more than just your smoke. You got to also grow your eats. You got to grow your food. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, here's and, some celery right here, right next to me. I'm literally just, I'm sitting at the. <laughs> exactly. I love yeah. revegging my celeries. Like when yeah, I, I taught the wife how to cut them so we can now reveg them and, you know, don't just, you know, kill totally. them. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it takes celery is like hilarious. It's like it takes seven months to get celery, but you know, right. it's, it's you got to start. Yeah. You already got a clone. Yeah. Totally. totally. <laughs> Stuff like that, man. It just becomes your lifestyle. You know, like he's growing in his front yard. I'm finally kind of overgrown my backyard. So I'm going to move to the side now and kind of just yep. like you're doing and just keep following the sun, man, because when you have property, eventually you grow, you kind of run out of space. So you got to kind of keep using what you got. And I like that front yard idea. That's pretty, that's pretty dope. Yeah, um, yeah awesome. just, you know, yeah, you know, growing all kinds of plants, guys, you know, that that's, that's how you become a really well-rounded farmer or gardener, because you notice little differences. Each, every plant is different. You know, everything takes a little bit, a little bit more care or less or whatever, but, um, yeah, man, I commend you for that. I like that, Greg. Good stuff. Man. Well, I appreciate that. And I think, uh, you know, it's one thing I can I can suggest to anybody that's trying to grow cannabis, um, you know, maybe for the first time or is just kind of um, getting into it or whatever. I think, you know, grow, put some cover crop in your soil, you know, or grow some specific um, things that you maybe want to see growing. You know, if you can grow weed in your grow room, like throw a couple peppers in there. You know, do some, you know, if you, whatever you want to eat, you know, or if you like herbs, you know, throw some herbs in there. You can grow some huge fat basil trees right next to your ganja trees. You know, if you like to make pesto or something, it's like, I would, if every tiny square foot is there to make you dollars from cannabis, then I, I understand. But I think even in commercial facilities, and there's so many strategies when it comes to companion planting that way out that outweigh the 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 loss of square footage maybe to you know a cannabis plant or some buds or something you know it's like you might might be the difference between your your ipm program working and or not you know and uh, may be able to supplement some of your nutrition too or uh the very minimum your staff is stoked because they get to walk by and pick a salad and go eat lunch you know like from something that they grew in their garden and that's like the, boom that shit is, um, there's nothing better than that, you know, and just, we got to get beyond the growing one plant at a time thing, you know, like there's so many benefits and there's so many positive, not only for the plant, but for us, you know, um, when we're, when we're working in the garden or when we're hanging out with our plants, like we love to do, um, there's benefits to growing other things that, um, are good for us and good for our mental health and shit. Greg, now you had mentioned cover crop. Uh, I would say the last few weeks, there's been various discussions, various viewpoints on that. Um, you know, some individuals obviously have make good good points on both sides. Uh, how do you feel about using cover crop, uh, especially when it pertains to an indoor living soil environment? Now, I think that there's, uh, there's pros and cons for sure. Um, I think on... At scale is where cover cropping becomes uh, the most beneficial. And especially when you're trying to build soil and build organic matter in your soil, 
most of us that are indoor gardeners, like we've already bought that shit. We're not building, we're not building the soil in our 30 gallon pots necessarily. We're purchasing, you know, already amended, you know, super high quality, you know, build a soil soil and then continuing to maintain that. So I think cover crop is important if you have a goal in mind um, around it. Like I said, there's plenty of people that want to put some little bit of food crops, you know, and grow them in their big pots, you know, under, because while they're in there, they want to be able to pick a snack or when they want to be able to come down there and harvest something for a dish at dinner or lunch or something. Um, that's a strategy, you know, as, as far as having cover crop in your 30 gallon pot or your, you know, I, for me, I, I don't really plant. There's a lot of people that are not going to like this, but I don't put cover crop in if it's less than a 15 gallon pot. And even then I'm kind of like 30 is probably the way to go, you know, like cover crop in a five gallon pot, these plants are drinking. Um, and when you get overgrown cover crop, you really got to manage it because that's going to be drinking up all the water that's there for your cannabis or, you know, whatever it is you're growing. Um, it's just, just, you got to manage your space. So if, if you're growing indoors and you have large beds, please put some cover crop in there. Maybe you want to put some nitrogen fixers in there because, you don't want to supplement nitrogen all the time, or you want to put some food because you want that around, or, you know, you want to put some, some pest, um, hibernation spots or some stuff for your beneficial bugs to live on, um, or around when there's no pest pressure or, you know, for me, clover, I don't really like putting clover in my pots inside because if there's any sort of, um, like spider mite infestation that comes in from anywhere, it's going to infest that first, which is good because I can see it and then I can remove it. So that's a strategy, but I try to avoid plants that attract pests I don't want on my cannabis, um, like right at the base, even though they might go to that and then I can remove it and it won't be on my plant. That is a strategy. I just prefer to not do that in an indoor environment um, at home. But I think there's, there is pros and cons. And I think everyone should just do what they, what they feel if it is, um, if it is living mulch only or, you know, whatever you're doing, I don't, I don't see if you're growing hydro and in cocoa, any reason to, to plant cover crop. Um, if you're just kind of draining to waste salt, um, you, your pot's probably tiny anyway, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, so, uh, could go the, one way or the, the other. verbiage you just had with more of a living mulch. I think that's it better describes, uh, than just saying cover crop. Because uh, it, it just kind of describes more of the thinking of the farmer. And I think oh. sometimes words matter when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, Absolutely. When, it, when you are using a living mulch, it does seem, you know, behind the scenes more. I hope I'm not revealing anything nobody wants me to. But there, it seems like some individuals are now using grasses because it does stay lower. And then they're trying to really actually get more fruiting body fungal aspects uh, to that. You know, they kind of maybe have had their their living soil system for a couple of years or a couple of flips. And now they want to experiment. Uh, have you seen that personally? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I actually like that strategy. Um, I think grasses are great. And when, I guess I should be clear when I'm talking about cover crop, that can also include stuff that I may not be using as say green manure, like the way that I would use rye or a grass is literally for biomass to then mulch um, and be food for the worms and the biology and stuff. The whole point, is to like grow it and then mulch it um, onto the surface of the soil. Now, I think that's of all the cover crop strategies that you could do inside, that one makes the most sense to me when you're trying to maintain um, a diverse system that is, you're constantly taking a lot of nutrition from the soil because cannabis plants just, you can get, they can get big, they, they eat a lot. Um, and if you can just maintain organic matter because want to churn it and burn in system like that's what your your bottleneck is going to be um versus something like nitrogen um where you know it's not super efficient in a small pot that you can expect uh your little cover crop of clover and vetch um and maybe some peas or some sort of legume to really make a ton of nitrogen for your plant um it'll supplement some stuff for the biology i think but at scales and we we're talking like pounds of fixed nitrogen, not necessarily <laughs> um, your little one square foot of space. So 
uh, I think grass is a great idea. Um, and um, as far as fungal dominance, uh, if you don't want to grow a living mulch, then I mean, just wood chips. So it's, if you're trying to achieve fungal dominance, then you're going to want to stay away from all the greens that you can and just use, you know, stuff like leaf mold and wood chips and, you know, and that's, will achieve the, you know, the same thing as far as mulch and keeping your moisture levels up and um, that sort of thing, but um, slower return on your organic matter. So good combination of both um, grass or some sort of, um, you know, browns when we talk about compost, you know, to be fungally dominant. Um, but I have a feeling if you start turning around a bunch of grass, you're going to have the opposite effect. Um, you're going to, you're going to turn bacterially dominant um, if you're mulching a bunch of greens on the surface only, you know, so yeah. it kind of, kind of depends on your goal, I guess, at the end of the day. Yeah, that's good points. Um, I like, you know, for me, I've said it before, but instead of the cover crop or the living, you know, I'm, I like to do more of a um, mulch. You know, I kind of make my own mulch. It's a combination of alfalfa, leaves, IMO, a little bit of amendments and kind of top dress that at the end of runs. And I found that when I'm worrying too much about kind of cover crops, it kind of gets in my way of wanting to just kind of at the end of a run, have this thing reset, re with my top mulch. And kind of reset um but I, I i do like you said uh greg i put uh peas in the corner of my living soil beds i, I under plant with basil and mugwort um those are things that can grow under our canopy because we don't realize like our canopy gets you know most of our light but if you look underneath the canopy there's a lot of um indirect lighting under there and a lot of these uh, plants can survive and not even take up your canopy space you know so i'm trying to peas right now um, they're growing, you know, if they grow, it's fine. If they don't, they'll just, you know, kind of be part of the biomass of the bed, but, um, just something a little extra to kind of keep, you know, keep me interested. And in. if I get a few peas, that'd be nice along the way, you know, so. No doubt. And I think it's a really good point too, that you bring up that, um, and this is maybe for the people that aren't about, um, cover crop or living mulch, um, indoors is that you really got to pick your crop, you know, like if I were to do um, a heavy layer of clover, unless I thin my plants, if I pack my canopy in, like that's going to be one of the first things to go, um, you know, it'll just die back. And that's kind of like, it's good for, you know, veg cycles or maybe within, um, you know, if you have a little bit of lag time between your, your flips and you can plant some cover crop right before harvest. And then in the, process of you flipping you can grow some stuff and then once your plants get big enough to choke it out you just cut it down um it seems like if you're trying to have a perpetual cover crop um in indoors with a very tight canopy um that's a hard thing to achieve um in at small scale you know if you have huge facilities you got all sorts of awesome side lighting from your aisles and there's lots of great examples of this sort of thing perpetuating over and over and over forever but um you know he made a good point too some of this stuff like vetch will literally take over everything it's bigger than it'll grow as big as the cannabis it'll it'll take it over so it's if you need clean space um then you know you got to pick your pick your crop correctly and, and one thing about grass is I uh, like I um, just had some wheat sprout up in my beds just on a random because I use a lot of IMO and they got some really long, aggressive roots. Like some of that stuff, like you said, I could imagine if you had that entire bed with wheat. Um, I saw the wheat roots going down to the bottom of the grass roots and actually coming out the side, you know, and I knew it was the wheat because it was the only thing in there. I had just started bad. So um, just things to think about, guys, you know, think it through. You don't want to end up with a, a mess that you can't really, you know, work with or, or something that's just going to be a kind of a harbor for pests. You know, do your research. Think about the types of plants you're using. Now, you Absolutely. had mentioned wood chips, Greg. Yeah, I would also use like bark, you know, you put it in the uh, you put it in the oven, I think at 200 degrees, 20 minutes. Uh, and then when, this is obviously small scale. And then once you're done with that, uh, when you add it to the, the system that seems like it's already building up with mycelium, there's just a kind of an explosion from that bark. 
I, I wanted to ask you this, Marco, too. Do you think that's more just because it's, I don't know, maybe it's it's a actual tree bark and then the wood chips are just, you know, kind of the baloney of whatever was was mixed together? <laughs> Well, I mean, I'll say my little two cents. I'll say this, Brian, that um, when you cut a tree and you want to use that tree for wood to like build with, the first thing you need to do is strip the bark off of it. And the reason being is fungi will colonize that bark first. I think it's probably has a lot more to do with the structure of the fibers of the bark. You know, if you take bark, it's pretty soft. If I take a piece of oak wood, I can't break it. So I think it's just more of um, it's a more of a easier access for those microbes to get up in there quicker. Yeah, I just that was, uh, you know, I don't know if that should be considered a, a gold nugget, but it just was something that I noticed, like when you would uh, start to see build up, start to see fungal fruiting, fruiting bodies of, of fungal aspects, uh, go out and get some bark. Uh, and then I would drizzle a little bit of that kefir. It has to be unflavored. Or now, you know, learning now more, you can make your own lab, basically kind of the same thing. But if you've never heard of that, it's, you know, four bucks for a little thing of kefir and a little bit goes a long way with that. And then you can really see an explosion for yourself of uh, just the microbial world and the fungal world and the way that it, I don't know, it, get, it seems like uh, when it gets to a certain level, Greg, that's when you start seeing the full genetic profile of the cannabis. You know, you're paying all these money for genetics. It does seem like that you have to get more of that fungal aspects to achieve that. I know some people would disagree with that, uh, but it does seem like in anything in nature, diversity is king, you know, and to build up that diversity, you really need to focus as an indoor performer on the fungal aspects because it is pretty easy to build the bacterial side of things. Definitely. And I think that, um, I mean, you just hit it on the nose, man. Diversity is the key and um, being able to derive nutrition from, whatever um source and from or through whichever physiological aspect whether that be bacteria or fungus or um you know all these things being mineralized it's uh it's important to have everything you know in general um when you think about building your building beds outside and building um kind of nutritional profiles perennials are going to want a more you know just the rule of thumb you know, um, perennials are generally want more fungally dominant and annuals, which are fast growing, are going to want more bacteria um, dominant. So I think the argument would be, you know, cannabis is a, an annual and generally the life cycle of the plant is shorter. Um, so you want to be churning and burning, um, you know, nitrogen and bacteria stuff. So uh, but you'd need if you're going to have a no till system, wood chip is the most important and then obviously organic matter from compost or whatever but and then having the soil not be disturbed but i would say in a no-till system something like wood chips would be i mean that's just you cannot put enough in the earth <laughs> yeah so true and now um now's a good time to get your wood if you catch someone cutting down a tree in the early spring you know the wood is now pushing out shoots if you can get your chips now they're even more better you know better for you that's got that ramayo wood in it which is the new tender shoots um just something to think about if you guys hear chainsaws running in the morning drive on over there because someone's probably going to be cutting a tree down and you can get some chips no doubt um let's see what else did i have on that um, oh go ahead brian i didn't i thought i had another question oh i just want to throw out there too if you're a beginner farmer maybe if you if you know this is your first uh i guess exposure to this uh and you don't want to continually cut your cover crop or your living mulch uh, a lot of people myself included we like using lionhead rabbits uh they will i mow down practically almost anything that you're putting there, especially for some of these guys behind the scenes that are using more of the grasses with the, with the bunnies uh, so that they're pooping in the, in the pots. And that is also helping build the, the fungal aspect without you having to do a single thing. I mean, you just kind of set it and I, the, the phrase isn't forget it, but it, it is pretty much set it and then just check on it every few days. 
uh, and it, the intelligence of the animal alone, you know, you can potty train it. So it's just something that, uh, uh, you know, you, you can have more fun with this, I hope. And I hope that's a tidbit if, uh, if a, you know, a bunny interests you. It does matter the species, or at least from my experience, it does. The, the dumber species, the dwarfs, the really common ones, I've never been able to get those to be potty trained. Uh, and they will pee constantly. So that's, I don't want to give you guys a headache uh, by suggesting stuff. But if you go out of your way and buy, and uh, like I think Marco was saying about breeding dogs and stuff, I mean, there's certain breeds out there in anything that are just a little more intelligent than others. And the lion head is that. Uh, and it looks cool as shit too. So uh, it's a win-win when you're using that system. And then um, just let the bunny run around. Uh, and it, 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 for the most part, if it has the area and you reward it, uh, it's pretty easy to potty train. You can Google that uh, fairly easy. Uh, and then again, you have just uh, as best as you can in a, in a uh, basement or a tent, a, a kind of a closed loop system. Mm -hmm. Man, I think we we never touch on animals in an um, indoor living soil system. I think, you know, it's it's pretty much the known if you're, you know, you got to be running animals. And, you know, if you're going to run a, a true regenerative system outside or in greenhouses or whatever you know you got to incorporate the the animal aspect of that whether that be you know pick your animal you know um but no one talks about doing that inside babe you might be the only person that i know that's running rabbits um around their living soil pots in their house and it's and it's perfect because you know rabbit next poop, level <laughs> yeah and rabbit poop is cold it's one of the few cold manures to where like they just poop right in the pot and it's good you know what i mean so you can't do that with you know chicken or cow or obviously you wouldn't be running those in your house anyway but you know it's just a unique little uh unique little system you got there well shout out to um since we're talking rabbits easy to garden my man has uh lindor uh living soil beds and between runs he lets the rabbits just just run there and do their thing in the beds and just eat the cover you know crops and and leftover plants that dropped and they're just pooping and this man that's i mean it's so cool man that's next level i feel like animals is the next level because um nature's always right brother steven was talking about that he turned us on to the fact that what happens in the pasture is you know animals that are in pasture they're they have a relationship with the plants where their feces and the plants now start having these relationships and the plants start giving the animals more of what they need back in return. So I just think that that, you know, bringing animals in is next level, you know, that's, I, that's not something to fear. I don't think, I think that's kind of the next evolution because that's already nature, you know, nature's already been doing that. So for us to just incorporate it, I think is just the next step. I also got a trade going with somebody for some rabbit poop. I'm going to trade, send him some IMO3. I'm getting some rabbit poop. So the nice. kind of shit that natural <laughs> farmers do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trading shit through the mail, man. Right. <laughs> well, you know, when you first get into this, you start to realize like, okay, worm castings. All right, what is that? All right, for the basic term of it, it's worm shit. All right, insect frass. Well, what does frass mean? Ah, uh, insect shit. You know, and you start to see that manures are really the, the power that kind of fuels the engines, bu builds the utopias that you're trying to achieve in those 30 gallon pots. And for the, the tent farmer, the basement farmer, I think that is the sweet spot because you can, for the most part, you can move them, for, uh, you know, by yourself. You know, if you're a smaller individual or a female farmer, uh, maybe 20, 25. But, you know, to, to kind of move them across a basement floor is, is pretty easy. You know, they kind of build pretty solid once once a few flips have gone by and then taking it to the next level and, and you know, maybe finding manures that you run and run or like we were saying, use a use of rabbits or you can even use a bearded. I use the bearded dragon sometimes uh, when there's overpopulations of, of bugs or rove beetles or slugs. Uh, and again, this is just another way that you can use Mother Nature to kind of dispel an issue that you have so you notice you monitor there's a there's a problem and for the most part the cool in the cool part i think of indoor farming is you can kind of find a, a solution for this so you want to break down more organic matter well there's springtails for that obviously isopods just different things that are going to break that down quicker for you 
how do you protect that? Well, there's a whole uh, integrated pest management system where you're using beneficials for that. And again, this is all using Mother Nature to combat Mother Nature or work with Mother Nature. And it can be achieved uh, with high success. Uh, just the, you know, the first flip or two, uh, as long as you're proactive. And again, like look, learning this kind of stuff. I mean, you guys see Greg's background behind him. I mean, I don't I don't see a deficiency in any of those plants behind you, sir. We're yeah, we're not looking that close. <laughs> but um, Yeah, man. I mean, it's it's all about working within the system that you're comfortable to work within and figure out what works for you and your your garden. And no matter what scale, um, adapt and just uh, keep with it if it works. Um, you know, like my plants are happy, my plants are healthy, um, living soil, you know, kind of like small pots, but you know, it's living soil systems. I wouldn't say that this is, I, I'm on the fence, you know, talk about regenerative agriculture and it's like, this is indoor gardening ultimately. Um, I don't know if that's fits in the category of regenerative. I don't know. Either way, I think it's, we can, we can, I'm growing beyond organically and with processes and closing loops wherever I can that, you know, resonate with what I see happening in nature. You know, obviously I'm having to create it um, indoors, but, uh, you know, it's a functioning system that's working well, you know, and the plants are healthy, they're, they're happy, and um, I don't have to do a whole lot um, when it comes to like nutrient management, those sort of things. You know, you just got to stick to your schedules and do that. And that's why I recommend to people too. It's like, if you're just starting to grow, find something, stick with it, do it. Don't deter too much. Us growers like to, oh, let me throw a little this here and a little that there and make it happen. I'll switch the recipe up a little bit. And then all of a sudden you're, you're not really doing science anymore. You're kind of who knows what's going on. And I love growing that way. That's kind of how I grow too. But I would recommend if you're just getting into it, Find something that works, find your groove before starting to, it's really easy to get distracted by all the shiny products that are out there and all the people talking about, you know, this or that with your yield, this or increased turp, this or whatever. Um, just start simple, make the plant is wonderful at figuring out what it needs. So, yeah, a lot of times we just need to kind of almost stay out the way, you know, <laughs> give Absolutely. the environment, give the give the feed, give the environment, kind of just be a guide, kind of watch over, you know, a lot of times people and, you know, we want to and I'm, I'm like you, Greg, like, man, I, I don't test, you know, I haven't ever really tested. I just kind of let my plants tell me. But that comes with kind of doing it for long enough and getting that experience. You know what I mean? Now, if I were to see something now, I may say, oh, what's going on here? But usually, man, when I see any kind of thing, I'm able to kind of correct it. And usually it's just a matter of um, uh, just a different, you know, kind of my recipe of my feed, you know, JLF or that kind of thing or, or adding a, um, you know, calcium, something like that. But usually, man, with the living soils, the great thing about them is they cycle so many nutrients that, you know, you don't have to mess with them a lot. And I think that's why I've when people say like they go to the fungal dominant versus the bacterial dominant and they say, well, cannabis is an annual, you know, that's true. But what we're doing is we're pushing hard. So we really want that soil to be cycling a lot more nutrients. I think that's where the fungal dominance with a fair amount of bacteria. I think that's the balance that comes into play. You know, Yeah, you got to have both. You got to have both. We want to make all the nutrients available um, that we need available um, in the quantities we need them like that's your additions as a living soil grower, you know, biology or things that'll build the biology. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a fertilizer input. It's a, it's a food for the thing that's going to make the fertilizer for you. And, um, exactly. you know, I think it's important to remember that too, you know, that when I, I respect the people that, you know, can you know, want that complete control over the plant and also understand, that if they that they can feed certain things and why they would do it to control what they need to control on the plant i got mad respect for that um it's just you know you got to do that with synthetics and pgrs and you know there is crop steering that you can do with just your minerals and but it's uh it takes a certain kind of person that really wants that i want to be able to feed this many milliliters this many times a day of this concentration um 
you know, that I just, I don't, I don't have that shit in me anymore. <laughs> you know? no, um, I just, I don't got time to do that shit. So, um, it's time, it's more of a, you know, I can, I can be a little more hands off. It's a little more forgiving, um, in living soil. And I just find it's the perfect trade off to where I can be less involved on the, you know, controlling what the plants are doing and more involved in like the magic of the process. And then also be have time to do, to live my life and not just, ah, man, I got to get home, like feed again, right. or, you know, I got to spend all this money on automation to make sure the resis are full and like whatever it's, uh, you know, on small, small scale, I'm talking, you know what I mean? In yeah. general, you know, I mean, there's lots not of enough things. people talk about that. Correct. Yeah, Honestly, I mean, to have to have your time back so that you can enjoy things in life uh, and not constantly yeah, be mixing. Yeah, it's and knowing that you're you're putting in the beginning work, it's a lot of work up front to build that. But knowing that things are going to improve over time, so that things get easier. Uh, I don't know about you guys. When I was first growing hydroponically in Rockwell, it seemed like as weeks progressed in each room. Granted, not everybody had a certain skill set. Uh, but it would just get worse and worse. Like it would just be like we were holding on to the rails constantly trying to make it work. Uh, where with a living soil system, you still have nuances. There's still a lot of uh, little things to learn. Uh, but the fuck ups aren't as noticeable as long as you're, you know, being a student of of this style and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, you, you definitely have to earn uh, a successful harvest. Uh, but it, you can kind of fuck up a little bit more. Maybe you do uh, overwater at, at the beginning or underwater at the beginning. It's not going to create such an issue. And I don't know about you guys, but just handling rock wool all day. I mean, it's just I, I personally just felt dirty, felt grimy, felt itchy. I mean, there's just a it just didn't feel like um, like it, like we were improving with things like, yes, we were farming a commodity, but there was definitely no like pride in what we were doing yeah i'm not a i mean everybody can grow it's teach their own you know what i mean i whatever you like to do but i think me personally i'm like there's just no way that i want to deal with the rock wool garden or um even i mean that should just persist for too long and you know i know lots of people that only clone in it but i'm just like man i don't like that either it's like a bunch of little clones in my soil eventually got to get them out you know it's the my soil body's not going anywhere and it's just loading up with rock wool so i don't know um teach their own though you know i've seen some amazing gardens with rock wool i've seen some amazing gardens with you know kind of the drained to waste cocoa block model and that isn't rock wool but same style you know seen a lot of those commercial systems i don't know why i don't know how that became like the the go-to um, given, I don't know who got that hooked. I know that my whole life growing in an illegal setting, um, you know, or a sort of side market setting was, um, not, a not hydro, you know, it was in soil. So people that adopted hydro systems, I think were, you know, they, that information, they were like, this is the way to do it. It's the best way to do it read a book or something or their their mentors were like this and for me it was all soil growers so working in a commercial facility that was hydro system was always very uh it didn't vibe in the right way not that i didn't enjoy growing weed but it didn't feel right you know and when you grow in living soil system at least me um it's just it feels it feels like i have a connection to the thing that it oh. isn't uh um it isn't just a, just a flip a switch, turn on mechanical. Be, growing weed becomes very mundane in that sort of setting, you know, yeah. but for me, for me, not for everyone. The people just love that shit, you know, but I, not for me. You know, I want to be, I want to be around a living soil where my hands are dirty. And I actually am, I have the biology of the system like on me and it is, you know, part of yeah. what I'm doing every day. I think that's important, at least for me these days. I agree. You said something important. I think connection is the key because yeah. I've um I've been in some, you know, done some things in some commercial facilities as well. And you don't have that connection. Like the plant is plant number X, Y, one, two, three, four, five, you know, oh, not doing well, cut it, toss it, throw it out. You know, like, whereas when you're in that living soil system, it's more like a family, man. It's like the plants kind of, 
I don't know. You just get a different vibe. I feel like the plants actually yeah. are giving off different vibes with being in the soil. And you can kind of feel that energy um, being in those facilities. Because a lot of those facilities, they may have so many plants, but they kind of have a dead feel to them. Well, it's like um, a hospital, man. I you agree. know, it's so sterile and it's so yeah. white and they all look the same. And, you know, and I get it. We get it. However, we also see the ones that are doing those large facilities and doing them in living soil, too. So we know it can be done. Uh, but I feel like you got much more of a connection, much more of a living connection when, you, when you're in that living soil. So if you guys aren't doing living soil, you should. And just talking to some new folks, you'd be surprised. A lot of the newer growers are still saying, hey, man, if I didn't know you, I would just go grow hydro. Like hydro still got such a big pull on people. So we got to keep Definitely. educating and, you know, doing what we're doing here. I mean, it has its benefits, man. I mean, I've seen some hydro style grows done with aquaponics that, you know, that look like a traditional hydroponic grow, but um, has that element of, um, you know, the living system, uh, like a living hydroponic. I guess that's what aquaponics are. It's a living hydroponic system, um, you know that's rad, you know? So I don't, I don't want to knock hydroponic weed, but, or I mean, hydroponic systems or any of that, but it's, you know, there is a certain way, um, that I think it should be done. And, um, there's other, there's other ways that, you know, are not as, yeah, not as fun to be around. Um, and I think it's in product too, you know, I think that totally. even, you know, we know that, you know, we know in product, but then I think some of the shirts and the suits don't, they just, it's dollars over that. They don't care about the customer and that end product. Um, yeah. Whereas we focus on that craft and we know that soil is where you're going to get that real craft. Uh, can I think so. I'm not knocking anybody. I've done them. Yeah. I've done them all. <laughs> so I can say that from out of my experience. Me um, too. Soil is going to be the best. Sure. No, Greg, I uh, I kind of pitched this as A to Z, and part of that uh, is kind of the the bullshit world of contracts and dealing with the suits. And I was wondering if you could kind of lay it. We we spoke with uh, Mr. Steensland um, and Mr. Duke Diamond about this on on just how to maybe some lessons learned on how to protect yourself. Uh, I feel like in that conversation, you know, it it takes money to enforce a contract, and I, you know, when you're first kind of you know, they're, they're moonlighting you and, and, and serenading you and everything. And you're thinking, all right, these guys are willing to write a contract. I don't, especially if you're a lot younger, I don't think you think about that. Like, yo, this, this corporation knows that they could fuck me and there's no way that I'm going to be able to financially go after them, even though they're making everything seem on point. So just wanted to let you maybe kind of talk about that as well. I know that we don't ever have to talk specifics, but just there's just a lot of bullshit behind the scenes that a lot of people need to kind of just maybe just even if it's a one or two red flags, at least you're recognizing like, hey, all right, this doesn't seem as, as rosy as they're making it out to be. Yeah, I mean, I would just say be gets I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just get a good contract lawyer. I guess if you're going to deal in contracts, then understand what you're what you're working with and maybe leave that on the professionals or be very versed about what you're doing. Cause I feel like, I mean, number one, handshakes are great among friends, but the handshake deals that you do with big corporations are probably never going to go your way, unfortunately. And that's coming from experience as well. So if, if you're going to do some big things and you're going to go into business with people like definitely do it contractually and get someone that knows uh, what they're doing to kind of interpret that for you. Obviously that's on your side. Um, you know, as far as red flags and stuff, I mean, if you're doing business with somebody like I'm, I trust my gut every single time. Um, and that's just me being an intuitive person. There's been times where I've shook the hands or signed the contracts and uh, intuitively it didn't feel right. And I did it anyway. And hasn't worked out ever. <laughs> Unfortunately, my gut hasn't been wrong yet. Um, so if there's just be be honest with yourself about what you're getting into business for and be real, be real comfortable with who you're doing business with. Um, because that's, yeah, that could be the make or break for you. And it's probably going to be, if it does go well, make sure that you're comfortable doing the business that you want to do with folks. 
um, before you sign that contract, um, for sure. Um, other than that, if there's money, like be weary of money issues, you know, be, I, I don't, there's lots of ways to get involved with the business. You know, you can be a director of cultivation. That might just be an employment contract that you're signing. Or if you're going to start a business with somebody and start a corporation and actually do the thing, you know, that's the levels of shit that you're going to have to deal with is quite a bit more. So speak to specifics on red flags. I don't know. Just, you know, know who you're getting a business with and understand um, the goals of each other at the end of the day and be very clear about that and honest with uh yourself about what you want out of the deal and honest with about what you're willing to do for that deal you know so i don't know if that helps yeah i think you know from experience you know people want to kind of hear that and you know it's it is what it is but it's always nice to to pass that on and i would like to say too that when they when some individuals think that your guard is down, that's when uh, they take you to dinner. So be very careful when they start asking you all these questions at dinner, uh, because there's an ulterior motive to that. And then there'll be a, you know, if, if this is from experience, if, if you're giving them what they want, all of a sudden you're going to a lot of dinners real quick. Uh, so, you know, think about the, the way that you answer things. Uh, if you are being, you know, courted with this kind of stuff and when they are kind of pulling out all the the red carpet that's when you you really should have your guard up uh and i don't think enough of us knew to tell each other that at the beginning i would agree um and i also would say for all the consultants out there um definitely or would-be consultants are thinking you're gonna get in to that sort of thing just you know be um be hesitant with your your question answering. Um, don't give away your IP and your skills. That's after all what you're going to be charging them for. Um, so yeah, don't answer. I mean, if someone's courting you and they're taking you out to dinner, I would imagine you don't want to be talking. It's a red flag if they want to ask you like how you would design the grow or asking questions about your you know what nutrient lines you'd use and shit like that you know like that's a those come with sops that come with consulting documents that get paid for um so if, if that type of company is courting you in that way i'd definitely be weary and don't answer don't don't give away the farm man you know mm -hmm. each person's skill sets unique to what they bring to the table and i think that that's valuable no matter what um and um, I wouldn't give it away. If you, if someone stands to make a lot, a lot of money or build a system off of your ideas, then definitely don't give that away for a dinner or two. Get yourself mm -hmm. a contract. Yeah, definitely. Just remember with contracts, it's all about leverage. And what that means is basically if you, it, you, they got money or whatever you're trading, you have something, knowledge or skill that you're trading. There's a point where you meet in the middle. And you can't give them that skill or that knowledge or that, um, that what you have before you get compensated. So you got to you got to think about that. Um, once you give them that or you do that work, now you have no leverage, meaning you have nothing to fight for. They have no reason to pay you. Sure. Go to court. Well, what's that going to do? Just tie you up. You're a working man. You not, Now you're not working for them. Now you got to go get a job and then try to fight them. Um, so one of my main things is knowing your value. You said that too, Greg, Brian, y'all all know that. And then the other thing I always like to say is try to get some money up front. Try to get a sign on bonus. If you're that legit of a company, you're big shit, you're big time. You value me that much. Let's drop some money here. You know, I'm moving. I got expenses. Give me good faith showing me that you're you know, into me as much as I'm into you. So, you know, meeting in the middle, meeting halfway, don't give sell the farm, you know, for nothing. And don't ever agree to back end deals where they're talking about they're going to give you this percentage, uh, but they're not going to pay you until the uh, the harvest comes through because they just don't have the funds, but they need you to carry it through or all that kind of stuff. If they don't have the funds today, I promise they aren't going to have the funds tomorrow. So don't put all your, your time and effort into something uh, where in the back end, you're probably nine. I don't know the exact, but it probably feels 10 out of 10 times. Uh, when the leverage is that heavy in their favor, they basically fuck you over and could care less. 
So just always think about yourself too. Like, yes, you want to be giving. Yes, more of the living soil crowd wants to help individuals out. And maybe at dinner, answering questions, maybe a little too honestly than, than we should. Uh, so just w with caution, you know, obviously always give away stuff. There's nothing wrong with, with educating, especially peers. But when it comes to the suit, and that type of individual that's really just trying to prey on you as as the knowledge base and then take whatever you say if they believe on that and then run with it uh, and they will not pay you for that. Uh, and that and that's the part that is really hard to stomach. If you've put a lot of time in, maybe you've thought about moving to a different state to get into something. I mean, it just affects your family. And then at the end of the day, you realize they were kind of uh, conspiring behind you in the first place. And that happens time and time again with probably so many people that have already been on the show uh, and it just sucks because the, the, the talent is uh, the, 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 the smaller time individuals that really like yourself, Greg and other people we've had on the show. Uh, if you would let Greg throw the, throw the football without the general manager coming down and telling him how to throw the football, I promise you that you would see a lot more successful farms all over the country. It's just the, the smaller, like, micromanaging individuals that don't even smoke cannabis that come down, you know, they got their new car because they got a, a now their dispensary owner, uh, but they don't understand how it works. And then after a few years, if you're not the hot shit anymore, you're not pumping out quality or you're starting to cut corners, which a lot of them do, including some of the living soil guys. After things don't start to work, you cut corners. And then what do you have? You have a subpar product, you know, oh, that felt like a latent rant almost. That was, that I was like it. pretty close. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. You need a good rant every now and then. <laughs> well, I want to see, I mean, I know what you're talking about, like kind of the maybe the darker, grayer side of things, but I hope in time maybe the suits start to see some of the people that have been on the show and a variety of other podcasts, and they start to see that it's like, yeah, money does drive cannabis, but you need somebody out there just throwing touchdowns consistently and having a team behind them so that on the defensive side of things, when that QB isn't on the on the field, they're still controlling things. There's, there's so many people that need to be involved on this uh, at the commercial level. And none of the suits, from my experience, really understand that to the to the point of when they're understanding, like, we need quality labor. We don't need 20 people. Let's find 10 quality people and then maybe even narrow it down from there. But that's not how they look at things. They want to pay individuals a sub, not even a livable wage. A lot of the stuff with the trimmers, I mean, that's how you get into it. Uh, but that's that's not the way, in my opinion, if I had millions and millions of dollars and I was trying to run this, I would try to get all the best people to play their role and understand that that's their role for this time. And if you continue to improve and work and educate yourself, there's going to be other roles for you to advance to. But that is not at all the way the dispensaries operate. It's fuck over every single body. The, the return on uh, the over, what is that? Well, they overturn, that's not the right verbiage, but like how often, how often individuals come through as like employees, you know? How expensive it is to train all of those individuals. If they really broke that shit down and listened to more of the, the basement type farmers that I feel like maybe try to would, would understand making money with this on a smaller scale, uh, taking it to a larger scale, dialing in your labor is just as important as dialing in everything else. And if they would understand that there'd be a lot more successful teams out there. Yeah, definitely, Brian. Good points, man. One thing that they don't do is like you said, the, the wages are always seem like they're a little bit low. And what happens is when you don't, pay someone what they think is fair then underlying you got an employee that doesn't really is not a hundred with you you know as, a, as an employer you know your goal is to have people 100 as a manager as a manager of people you know and you can do that if you do that if you like you said brian start with a smaller team um you know then you can have a better quality core a step farther for me is i can't take back the fact that you just see where greg is sitting he's in front of his own shit you know what I mean? He's owning his own shit. It's difficult. Like a lot of young folks, you think when you go work for these big, all right, I got a job in the, in the cannabis um, cultivation, right? You think that's the, such a big thing, but it really, that could be one of your worst time periods in life. Because what happens is sometimes those, those facilities, 
don't have very good systems in place for the employees or for processes. And a, a happy employee knows what he's doing, when he's supposed to be doing it, and how it's supposed to be done. A lot of these facilities don't even have step one of that in place. So now you got a bunch of employees walking around, which you don't really know what they're doing. And what happens is your plants suffer. So then their quality suffer. Now your brand suffers and the shirts don't really see it that way. Um, this stuff really just like our soil, man. And we're everybody doing a little rant, but it's kind of like our soil, man. We start from the from the soil up. You know, the soil is where it all happens. And it's kind of like your processes and your systems and your and your facilities should should follow. So some of the young folks, I would I would focus more on owning my own stuff than I would to get my foot into a certain door. Because what's going to happen is if you learn what you're doing, you're going to be that much better. And if the door does open later, you're probably going to enter it into a higher position than just starting out at the bottom. So. Uh, one other thing I learned with the contract stuff that I, I learned from another mentor was uh, if you really are thinking about changing your life, you know, whatever that entails to you moving or just going all in for somebody else, uh, you need to watch how they treat their family. And I, that always stuck to me when this individual shared that with me. And I, I've carried that. I think I was like 23 or 24 at the time. I've carried that throughout life, even with potential employers and, and general managers at other industries and stuff. Uh, if, if you really are getting that close to somebody, it, it is pretty telling when you when you see how they, you know, how, how do they talk to their spouse? How do they talk to their children? Because it's going to be a lot worse for you if things go south. Uh, so that was a that was a maybe a gold wagon of, of bars uh, that that gentleman taught me. And um, that all comes back from uh, the bartending days. When you said I was I was fortunate enough to work at this place called the Ford Plantation in Savannah, Georgia. And these individuals are super high net wealth individuals. Uh, but it was interesting to always just sit across from them because they sit there, they get drunk uh, and they would really reveal some like life. You know, like I met the, the guy that created Target and he was basically telling me like the simple life is the best life, kid. You know, all these like old, old things. And I, I've kind of always carried that in from the cannabis space. You know, if you keep it simple, you, you focus on the plant, you focus on being at least successful with a, a few flips uh, and then get more involved with it. Uh, man, are you going to have success? And life's just a little bit sweeter when you make things less complicated instead of adding all those nutrients like Greg or Marco had mentioned. And that's exactly what we almost everybody wants to do when they first get into this. They find out about some other new amendment or some other form of this or that. Uh, and that's, it just causes problems. Speaking of keeping it simple, Greg, uh, run us through just kind of your cloning process. I like to, uh, you know, ask everybody that, even though it's such a simple thing. You know, what? How do you clone, man? All right. Well, um, uh, depends. Like at home here, I'm strictly in the clone machine. Um, I've, you know, kind of got it dialed in. It used to be I couldn't get super woody strains to to root in like a clone machine, um, but I've kind of fix that and I have success with even like the oldest OGs in the clone machine. So I just rocked that, man. I got a 48 site, um, uh, turbo cloner works great. Um, I literally, you know, clone like anyone else and, you know, pull the plant off, put it in clean water, healthy, healthy mom, clean water. That's all you need to clone. You know, um, I don't use any sort of, um, hormones. I used to do aloe all the time, but, um, I don't really even do that anymore. Um, literally just take the cut, um, clean it up. I'm one of the people that kind of cuts the sides, um, of the clone, you know, cuts the leaf off. Um, mm -hmm. a lot of people are kind of purists. They don't like to remove the leaf, but I do. Um, what do you and, um, cut and then just, just, just grab them and cut the whole Yeah, time? no, I'm a little more, uh, in a commercial setting, that's kind of how you got to do it. Um, I actually, I ran a clone facility, um, from 2018 to 2020. Um, we had like 60,000 square feet of greenhouse and I was just doing hemp clones, um, for folks. So I've done cloning on like huge commercial scale. You can't really do turbo cloners and kind of clone machines at that scale. Got to get kind of preforma trays and yeah, like grab big bunches of clones and just <laughs> chop right off the top, you know, and mm -hmm. you're cutting, you know, lots of shit and put them in big cups of like, at that point I was using aloe, but, um, you know, at home, just cut it off the plant, put it in some water. I, um, I will let it sit in the water for um, overnight or at least like a day. Um, just clean water, put it in there, let it sit for a day, 
and then I'll bring it out, give it a fresh cut, put it right in the clone machine. Mm -hmm. um, and that works out. The plants sim like kind of harden off a little bit overnight. Um, and, you know, in a couple of weeks, I got blown out roots. That's a gold bar right there. His style, just just hearing this man's style, that's a that's a that's a gold bar. I like the part setting it overnight, but then when you pull it out, that extra cut, I think that's dope. I like that. Got to get a fresh cut. So, but yeah. that's you know, I find that if your plant has proper nutrition, then you're not going to they're not going to yellow out or get weird over the course of a couple of weeks. Obviously, if you get them super rooted and you leave them in your clone machine for too long, you better start putting some nutrition in there because mm -hmm. um, they'll start they'll start drinking that water quickly. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, man. I, I used to always do um, kind of root riot or, you know, clone plug, um, peat composite, whatever clone plugs. Um, and just lately I have the quality has fallen off so bad that I feel like um, none of my clones were taken. The ones that did take were like super unhealthy. So I just kind of scrapped that all together. And now it's like all of a sudden there's zero expense. For taking my clones it's literally like at home it's like i don't gotta buy clone trays i'm gonna buy clone domes or you know any of the the flats i don't gotta get um you know clone x gel or any sort of hormone i don't gotta spend money on um you know the plugs themselves um literally it's just water um and the plant and you know i will spend a little bit of money over time on razor blades <laughs> which right. is essentially a negligible cost um but that's it you know so you run a cycle like, timer uh like a one on four off or yeah yeah um the way i i let it run for 30 minutes on 30 minutes off okay. um i can actually run it um it's uh it's in a um a cooler area of the house um in the summertime um when it's a little bit warmer, I, I have to run 15 minutes on and 45 off. Um, oh, because the heat will heat it up. Yeah, yeah. I got to give that 45 minutes off because then if it cycles <laughs> after a few hours, like the water is like 80 something degrees and then you're just asking for trouble, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's something to be mindful of in clone machines. A lot of people, I think, struggle with that because the water temperature will get too hot. And then anything that's if, if you don't, it's not perfectly clean. I'm talking like if you open it up once you know like you're gonna get oh. <laughs> all the shit growing on there you know right. so um water temperature is definitely crucial when it comes to the clone machine method but other yeah. than that managing that like it's you, literally you can you don't have to worry about the clones drying out you know and have the water it's literally like i put them in there and then two weeks later i got roots and I'm transplanting it's you know easy peasy nice one thing that's uh, worked for me is the one minute off four minute off i use that I, the old school cap timer used to you can't adjust it just one on four off okay and, yeah 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 and that worked I, i've still been running that for i mean for a long time so that works too if you if you notice deficiencies, are you foiler feeding, Greg, or how how do you minimize that if uh, you're newer to this and you're noticing uh, issues? Um, I mean, like in the clone machine or just in general? Yeah, in the clone machine, like somebody wants to now go try this out for themselves, uh, you know, and they maybe have deficiencies when it's first first kicking off. Like, how how would you amend that? I mean, if it's if you start to see deficiencies right out the gate. Um, but you're not seeing that like in your mom plants or anything like that. Um, you know, there's, there's a few answers to why that could happen. I would try to figure that out, that out first, you know, if it's, I mean, maybe it's the water that you put in your clone machine, you know, and then at that point, it's like, no matter what you do, bowl your all you want to, um, you know, if the plant's going to be absorbing any of that liquid, it could be locking it out. I don't know. Um, kind of spitballing, but yeah, if, if, if anything, I mean, you're going to have to either, add some sort of nutrition you know some sort of available nutrition to the clone um basin clone machine basin a lot of people are saying that the plants don't drink from that before they're rooted but i don't know how if i believe that they have to be drinking something um but the um bowyer is the obvious route um especially if the plants are not are not rooted then yeah foliar. um i would do probably like an amino nitrogen foliar um of some sort if it was you know or make I mean, you could do cow mag i guess you, whatever the deficiency you're seeing i guess um cafe yeah. but yeah something like that could work <clears throat> absolutely um you know but generally uh if you're if your mother plants are happy and healthy and are loading nutrition in their tissues like they should you shouldn't have any issues with them locking out um 
if you got clean water. In my I, experience. Yeah, and I those those things are cool. It's just when you're first starting out and you're taking clones, you might not also always have the eye to know, like, all right, yes, this is a clone, but it's pretty weak. So then when you take that weak clone, you put it into there. Sometimes it seems like there's just uh, issues that happen or people start to add certain amendments to that water uh, and then it just kind of gunks up. Uh, do, do you kind of co-sign with when you're using the water, using some kind of surfactant uh, like a yucca extract or something to just kind of keep the water a little wetter? In the clone machine? In the clone I machine. I don't do that. I definitely don't do that. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it work for several people. I mean, this whole rave with the Q and Jay Plant Speaker and, um, you know, like I'm sure there's a lot of people in our community that have seen that and been like, that's insane, um, you know, but it's, it's working. It's he's proven it. this, you know, that dude's no bullshit. So, you know, if there's something to put in saponins in the water that um, that will help rooting somehow, I mean, amazing you know um same with aloe you know kind of get the best of both worlds you get some saponins and you get some of those those rooting hormones um that are generally synthetically derived and it's not from aloe but i'm all about clean environment when i'm when i'm cloning versus trying to manage nutrition or anything biological i'm like i'm keeping the biologicals out i would prefer to just not add anything at all and then as soon as they hit the dirt or whatever the root meeting it rooted medium is after that. Um, so then start giving whatever it is, you know, aloe mm -hmm. or Q or some sort of surfactant, you know. One thing I one thing I like in the cloner is I just like chlor chlorinated tap water. You know what I mean? Believe it or not, because I do want in that in that time before I get roots, I do really want to focus on no biology. I don't want anything rotting. And actually, <laughs> chlorinated tap water will will clone in the machine. And hey, the chlorine actually dissipates, I think, after maybe a day or two. But yeah, it, it doesn't hurt. Giving away nuggets there. That was, you know, <laughs> that's uh, that's truth right there. Um, I do the same thing. I usually don't tell people that, but of course, like that's the way. Um, that's what chlorine's made for, you know. And if you don't open that clone machine, like you trust your situation, and you put it in there, and you let that chlorine dissipate, all of a sudden you gassed out, and essentially, um, you know, you help sanitize the inside of the machine you know and then if you don't open it boom you're like it's gold clean roots every time guaranteed yeah guaranteed <laughs> now when yeah, you take yeah, that and second I, and, cut sorry buddy sorry Marco. Love uh when you take that second cut are you doing it like you know somebody that's maybe a, a rose florist or something where they cut it underneath water have you ever seen any uh, validity to that extra step being viable and being effective um yes absolutely um i haven't seen i would like i've asked this question a bunch i haven't done much research on it but i don't know if there's a I, I wonder how long like the embolism takes to you know if you leave a clone out in the air for it to block you know being able to take up um liquid uh i, I don't know how long that takes so yeah I, I don't usually cut them underwater but i will cut them in the air and then put them directly in the clone machine like i'm working in front of the clone machine i've already done all my prepping work for i'm not cutting anything off i literally pulled out of the water sn slice it put it into my my clone machine right away so it's it's basically the same thing as cutting it underwater like it's going from my hand to the clone machine in two seconds you know maybe that's too slow i don't know like i said i don't have any data on how long it takes but the plants never wilt i never get a single wilt and if i do expose them to air for too long then I'll notice that they'll wilt in the clone machine when you first put them in there. Um, and then obviously they'll come back. But yeah, the, the fresh cut is basically so that I don't get wilt. If I put um, them in there straight from the cup, a lot of times they've embolized and uh, the clone machine will do weird things to them. So I just, over the years. Is that, that how they get the little wet noodle? You know how like the yeah. stock gets like over time? It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's well. That could be like a, it's probably fungal wilt actually that causes that more than likely. But uh, you know you're done when that happens. Yeah, yeah, but that's at that point like your whole clone machine's done. You know, if you if you got like wilt the clone machine, that's the one thing that like I have to be careful about. You know, if I have a virus on a plant or if I have something, you know, I got to be very careful with putting them into the same clone machine because if I'm trying to 
you know, save a genetic or something, that might be a case where I have to isolate a dome with some clones because I don't want to, you know, give anything to anything else. But yeah, if you get that, if you get that slime in your clone machine, like it's, you better, better pray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I like that. I'm, I'm with you. I used to do the underwater thing. And then over the years, I just went to just cutting and putting it in. I never really noticed a big difference with that. But you, when you when you do start out or when you read stuff, they do make a big thing about that. And I'm like, well, bullshit. I got roots. You know, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you know, it's not that critical. Maybe starting out, though, getting good practices, doing that, making sure you're conscious of that, not letting that um, you know air bubble in there. So maybe things like that are good when you're starting out, just to give you a routine. And as you get better, you pick and choose the the, what, the things you want to keep in your regimen. Yeah, it, I think there's I don't think there's such a thing as being too clean when we're talking about clones. So just, you know, cleaning your equipment and being, you know, having a a very clean space, you know, taking clones with the dirt all over, like in your grow room. Like, don't be surprised if you lose a few or if you lose a whole tray or something, you know. So being more cleanly than you need to be, I think, is important for making sure that your success rate's super high with clones. What what are your thoughts on like when you are taking clones and they're more of like a hollow stem? I haven't seen any issue with that. Um, I know that some of the um, like the hemp varieties um, were growing so fast uh, in the greenhouse, but like by the time we would come back to take our next round of clones off them for when we were filling orders, I mean they were massive stems and fully hollow. They were growing so fast that they just like the 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 inner pith or whatever couldn't keep up you know so it was just fully hollow i didn't have any issues with them like the rooting success but they're i find them to be more brittle um like when you're actually like it wouldn't matter for the clone machine um at all but if you're trying to stick them in something i find that like the hollow stem is like they'll break a bunch more if you're trying to put them in a clone puck or trying to slide them in a piece of rock wool or something um i just find them to be more like fragile than a solid clone but i haven't of the ones that do get stuck or the ones that get in the clone machine i don't seem to see any difference in the way that they root yeah i agree the hollow stems on root too definitely i remember back you know hydro seemed like the they grew so fast as the stem was almost hollow all the way to the you know to the base almost you know now like living soil just to seem like the tips will kind of give you that hollow while they're kind of have it caught, I guess, caught all the way up to, they're growing so fast, not really sure, but. Yeah, I'll see stems, yeah. start, like you'll, they'll get those like stress cracks on them or sometimes, you know, cannabis will have that little bit of uh, certain strains that have like like kind of that papery um, bark or whatever on it. Yeah. Um, and that shit will kind of like split and kind of like fall off, like especially seedlings, you know, like the ones behind me. Um, these things are just kicking off right now from seed. I just got them transplanted and they're like, dude they're banging so they're <laughs> like the like it's from where the cotyledons attach at the your very first true before the first true leaves like it's it's like splitting and like shedding its skin from there it's wild it's growing that's so a fast. good sign yeah it's good <laughs> build it's the soil good. light man it's the best uh, for, when it when, when, it, when it comes to <laughs> yeah yeah Hey, when it when it comes to cloning and you're cloning from a mother and let's say that that mother has gotten a uh, older and it's now kind of created almost a, like a woodiness bark to it. There's some people that say that 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 those genetics are kind of like run their course. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And do you believe that keeping a cannabis plant since it is meant to die and then and move forward? Uh, do you notice that with your breeding that if you are keeping moms for too long, uh, you're just end that you end up breeding weaker plants? Um. I don't, I think weaker is the wrong word. Um, I noticed that really woody plants and OGs have a tendency to do this quite quickly. Um, you just got to replace your moms more often, but um, like every, you know, I wouldn't keep an, an OG mom for more than maybe six months tops. I mean, I've had them around for a year and then it's just like, you never get the things to root. Not that the genetics are bad. I mean, we're asexually propagating, um, you know, from a mother plant, actually, like, I feel like the genetics are going to be more consistent when you're propagating off one really old mother plant versus a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone. You start getting 
you're pushing evolution in a direction when you're a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone, you know, uh, quicker. It's like generational. And you'll start to see, you know, subtle differences um, if you grow something for a long time. So I think keeping moms around is good. When they get woody, they just suck to work with. You know, they get brittle. Um, they start growing lanky and then they don't root. You know, you might, your, your success rate drops off. Um, and then the flower doesn't, like if you were to flower the mom, it wouldn't be that great. Um, genetically, I haven't had, I don't really breed with those type of plants, but I can't imagine them really being different. Um, I feel like the, the, like a plant duds out, like when we talk about dudding a plant out versus like the plant's just old, um, that's a different thing. You know, a virus plant will cause that kind of brittle woody thing, the HVLD, the, or yeah, HLVD or whatever, um, virus will do kind of what you're talking about to a plant, but it'll just happen quick. Um, obviously that plant's going in the trash, but, um, super woody. It doesn't concern me that much as far as breeding with it. I wouldn't think I just get annoyed with a plant that's not really growing good anymore and just kind of taking up space in the corner. So <laughs> switch the mom out. Yeah. Cause a lot of the, the, the basement tent farmers, you know, it, it seemed like they were going more to a uh, perpetual harvest. So they were just always keeping clones, keeping things around, uh, keeping more plants than they needed at that stage uh, so that they didn't have moms. On the flip side of that, on the commercial side of things, still to this day, uh, there's most of these larger co commercial facilities have a mom room or have like plants that look honestly like, like hobbits or something you know it looks so old uh, and, they're, and they're it's weird because they're kind of proud of it in a way yeah i mean i i don't know man i mean that's it's if you're in a production facility the last thing you want is old plants hanging around you know <laughs> especially if they're for clone uh propagation or something like that you know so keep it fresh yeah, yeah, keep it fresh. Yeah. Keep it fresh, keep them healthy. Um, it's just, I've seen that in multiple commercial facilities too, where I'm just like, this plant is, you've been growing this plant in a five gallon pot for seven months. You have to water it all day, you know, like you, you seven times and it's all root bound and, you know, 10 feet tall. And you take like a hundred clones off of it every two months. Like, it's just, what is this doing in your? you know in your room here you know like just to have two moms that are smaller and then you know cycle them yeah. out you know brian that just made me think of something man like i wonder if it's also that you know they there's no you know mom care department in the big facilities there's nobody kind of tending to them they're just you know left in there they water when they water and you know because if you keep an old plant kind of like even bonsai you can you know, prune the roots, prune the top, you know, you can get that vigor back if someone was kind of putting a little bit of time into it. Um, I don't know if that's worth the investment. I'm I'm kind of more, you know, along the lines of just clone of clone, keeping it going that way, because I don't see anything, you know, that I'm trying to keep a long lineage on, you know, not being a breeder or something. But I know with you, Greg, you definitely have those challenges because you don't want a clone of clone too much, but then you don't want an old uh hobbit mama either you know as brad would say so totally totally yeah i think uh investing in a veg department head is um you know a lot of businesses are doing that i got some friends that hold that position and mm. i think that's arguably one of the more important positions that you could have in the garden I mean, you got to keep your genetics you know around and not mixed up which is easy to do if you're just clone of a clone like oh shit, you know uh, this whole section is supposed to be this strain. You snip one clone off from a different strain and that's how shit gets lost um, in the mix. Um, and everybody's done it. <laughs> I've done it. You know, like, oh shit, this is the wrong clone. It's the last one. What am I, you know, sayonara, you know? But uh, having a veg head, or a veg head, uh, a veg department, um, like director, you know, head of that um, part of your business is probably... The, uh, I don't think you can invest your money better than in someone that knows what they're doing there um, and your genetic department. So I think that's, uh, that's a goal <laughs> yeah, for the suits. Uh, if any suits are watching, listen to the, what we're saying here. We're trying yeah. to tell you. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> Create roles for your team. 
Let them know. Yeah, that, man. They put a couple years. Yeah, in let them. That you're not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and let them and let them do it. You know what I mean? Like put people in charge and let them own it. Um, yeah, let them throw the and, football. You know, like what is it? Right. You'll retain them. You know, and like it's as many facilities I've managed. I've I I'm a firm believer and seen it in action when I when you give people the power to to kind of own their you know their wins and own their losses um and then they do it for you it's uh that's the that's the type of team that you want to have um and the ones that won't leave you know because it's their i mean extraneous circumstance circumstances aside it's the people want to work for you because you aren't up in their ass all the time micromanaging them about something that they're capable of doing and it also gives them the ability to to either shine or not and i think that's important you know at least for for me being a manager and you know kind of letting the staff do what i need them to do i need them to trust that i'm gonna let them do what they what I, they told me they could do and let them prove it <laughs> little max said suits don't listen they already know everything Good point. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Good point. you know what sucks too is the suits usually have some kind of family member that works there Almost like they see it as like their eyes or their ears and they usually have yeah. no work ethic and they just like, uh, th that's another thing too. I, I think if you're really creating your team, then you need to find the best p person for each position. And if that happens to be your cousin or, you know, your brother's best friend or what, whatever the situation is, then yeah, that, okay. Uh, but there are so many people out there that just hire, hey, I know this guy, this guy works, he used to be an Uber driver. Hey, this guy worked at a gas station. Let's bring all these people in. And then they can't keep up when you're trying to work at the commercial facility. And that's not their fault. Uh, you know, that's the that's putting your team together. And uh, again, they want to. Who wants to come and trim for like 10 bucks an hour? I mean, that's that's a very small pool of individuals. Uh, and then, you know, if let's say you get a raise at six months is a dollar more. Like what incentive do these people really have to give a fuck about your company, your brand? Uh, so I. I can't stress that enough. I don't I don't think you should just blatantly like just hand out uh, bonuses and rewards just because somebody's doing their job. I see a lot of that, too. Like just because you showed up on time doesn't mean like, hey, you were giving you some kind of pat on the back. But the individuals that go the extra mile when the suits give, especially that, you know, the guys growing the cannabis, when they give them more of an incentive or a bonus, just the, the overall perk. Uh, you know, everybody seems to like perk up and, and just take pride in everything. Um, it's really hard when you're making a, a measly salary and you see the suits get into their cars after telling you what to do. Uh, it's it's really hard not to have that resentment. Yeah, and everybody can count. Everybody knows how to count plants. Everybody knows what's harvesting. They know how to weigh shit and all that. So that's why, you know, you're so trans, it's such a transparent industry. So you kind of you really should have your people buying into it. You know, you really need that. So, but yeah, man, this has been a nice one. What were you? Okay. Three hours flew on by. Yeah, man. It's, uh, as it does. usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, talk to talk to you. Yeah. We should get the questions going for you and yeah. Um, yeah, let's respect your time. But as always, man, I, I think you are the, the most uh, guests that I, that we've had. You know most appearances of a guest uh, also shout out to you know your past your buddy nick t has been on the show before i think uh, just having you guys chop it up uh really helped our little show uh springboard man or like a year and a half ago so just thank you well, for yeah, taking great, your man. time for anybody really gave a shit. Nice. Yes, i really appreciate you uh inviting me on again man it's always always a pleasure and uh yeah, for all the people, if there's people in here that are going to the secret stash, man, find me and you know, let's let's get some genetics popping in these uh, in some of these grow rooms. Then we can start talking about that a little bit. Do some grower showcases and shit. Is there a date or is that a secret? Uh, it's on March 26th. I think it's sold out though, so um, it's kind of people already got their tickets or not. But um, either way, you can always hit me up if you're interested in genetics. Hit me at IG or. Um, you know, emails there too. Definitely, I and like it's fun. Page. There's like a DJ stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Nicotine's actually DJing. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. And DJ, DJ Sin, and, uh, I think, was the last okay, one. Yeah, there's, uh, I'm sure there's a few. Yeah, but, just, um, just quality shit. Yeah, man, it's gonna be a dope event. Yeah, 
those things. Be a good one. Something that I would definitely love to come to. And there was a there was a question earlier about genetics and outdoors in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, Soil Born Addictions was asking if you knew of any early finishers outdoors for Colorado. Um, I mean, generally, um, citrusy strains, lemon strains, stuff like that. Um, like just just kind of generally, we'll finish uh, sooner. Colorado, anything with uh, with the one in it i've bred a, a few strains that unfortunately have sold out quickly but um with the one in it which is very similar to in genetic profile to like something like flow um i think it's kind of off opposite parents but you know it's thai afghani um that shit will finish into september latest um wow. in colorado um there's also uh there's a cushman's cut that's around that finishes like into september also um, which is nice. Um, any, anything like that kind of Bubba, um, you know, your typical short, um, stocky plants are going to do good and you could most likely full, full sun, you know, um, pull them around then you could stretch them with, with some cover, but, right. um, yeah. And as far as, I mean, I have, uh, yeah, the conductor, um, he put up actually there was a picture up earlier as far as my genetics go just to throw the plug in there the conductor one of uh six finos finished like september 21st or something last year he threw a picture on the beginning of the show you'll see it's super purple it's on my yeah. IG also. here we go um, let me put that back up for you real quick but yeah the conductor which is um a fantasia cross um it's bubba diagonal across the platinum tesla crossed with fantasia um yeah. and that finished yeah. super early um that specific one finished real early and all of them are down probably by the 6th of october um yes. and then the fan there was another row of fantasia right next to it as well um that also finished super early and this That's is beautiful. in and this is in northern colorado um front range um so lots of weather extremes and shit boom that that's was, what i'm talking about that was a hemp plant right there that's a that's yeah. one of my industrial um like I, I'm working with a, a Chinese industrial variety um, and I crossed that with one of my high CBD hemp varieties and sure. literally made like a 12 foot tall tree. <laughs> <laughs> that, that thing seriously is a Christmas tree. Dude, yeah, it's like the perfect shape. It would it would have went forever. Like you could have grown that in a tropical plant climate forever. You know, it would just never have finished. <laughs> wow. God, that was but, pretty. But yeah, Conductor and Fantasia, good seed varieties for me that will finish early in Colorado. Um, and then there's lots of cop crosses that'll go forever. So, and is the Fantasia, is that stuff good for indoor too? It's amazing. It's okay. amazing. That's why one, the, the cup with was the Fantasia. Okay. Um, and it was indoor grown, um, yeah. in living soil. So Fantasia and the conductor, um, both do, I mean, amazing. They're done no longer than nine weeks, usually in the, you know, kind of 60 day range. Nice. Nice. No, I don't. I don't think I heard this covered. You guys covered a lot of awesome things. I especially enjoy, you know, contract talk, kind of the background of the industry, because you know, like I think Brian said, there we didn't, or there's a lot of people who didn't know they were supposed to share this information, or didn't share the information, because there's a lot of people that, you know, would love to get into that aspect of it. So. Totally. Yeah, man, we got to learn. We got to learn from history. So I appreciate that. But um, speaking of history, kind of, I noticed behind you, you got some HPS is that uh um, no it's actually um it's is it? a, it's a ceramic metal halide okay uh, okay it's right. just in the it's in the old um uh huge triple xl uh the yes. six inch triple xl hoods oh but i had those. Uh, right. plenty of it's them. Uh, i just had a bunch of hoods but it's yeah it's actually a 315 watt cmh with the adapter just using um a very flat hood since i you can see i have a bunk bed um grow behind me so to get that second level um <laughs> like not burning under the lights i had to use right. the super thin triple xls but yeah no it's a nice. it's a cmh which is okay legacy lighting these days too you know what I mean? it's still ceramic metal ally but yeah they, they i mean they work they i still, still have crush, i still have mine around it's not in use at the moment but i'm not afraid to pull it out either yeah but if I've i heard... need to use it i got it they they still work they i feel like they last forever you know <laughs> yeah and hey in the in the winter time in a cold area actually it's a lot of people prefer to run them still just because you're not paying the heater as well totally. but uh in in a small enough space where it makes a difference 
Definitely. But sometimes people will talk about like readers will talk about different expressions, maybe under like a HID system versus a LED system. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you've ever played around with or oh, noticed yeah. Yeah, or my, discussed? Um, I have um, like my testing tents. I have um, ceramic metal highlights and I have two different LEDs. Um, I have a comp LED um, from Germany. Um, that's like an adjustable, um, it's actually using like a six by six space. And then I have a Helio Spectra um, LED also. And that's, I test under all of this along with outdoors. So I get to see definite different expressions depending on the light. And I get to mess around with that because both the, the lights are fully tunable. Like I can tune all the spectrums um, however I want. So I can, I can do some interesting things with, uh, with flowering times and also like just full expression of flower profile. You know, the smells are always about the same, but I can definitely get some interesting structure um, on the plants. And um, there's some manipulations you can do that, you know, do cool shit. <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely see that you, you, you're you going to get different plants if you grow under a, you know, a traditional HPS versus an LED. You're gonna so have you, to, so you do feel them. like the um, turf profiles remain about the same, though? I do. I do find them to be similar across the LEDs that I've used. Okay. And as far as ceramic metal highlights. Honestly, find ceramic metal heads grow some of the greasiest, biggest trichome heads we've ever. Uh, you know, I know some um, kind of old school hash washer dudes that just keep their VPD super, super, super high, way higher than it should be in flower and run CMHs. And I've never seen heads, resin heads collected solventlessly like this. So I think there, I definitely see um, wonderful expression of trichomes under um, a more balanced ceramic metal halide spectrum just in my experience but i love the leds they're cost effective and really do whatever you want with them yeah that's awesome and and you know who knows some people even do both both in the same oh, place same time so definitely seen them staggered before too which i think is you know there's all sorts of cool lighting strategies you could do if you got the right tech to really measure it <laughs> well now you can um now the leds mimic so hps or CI, ceramic high, metal highlight like the new leds can mimic any spectrum so it's like i flipped mine and tried the hps spectrum look just like the old hps you know what I mean? yeah so totally kind of cool. i mean the spectrums are they're out there. They give them to you. Yeah. They're on the, the bulb box or whatever, you know, it's just like exactly. <laughs> with the right diode in the right place and, you know, get your reflector right. And you've got the same damn thing. It's way yeah. more cost effective. And, and I just had one more because we were talking yeah. about it earlier before, you know, everybody, um, you know, kind of gets their their shout outs and last words here. Uh, and again, appreciate your time. I know we're keeping you a couple minutes over uh, here. Good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm having fun. Good deal. Good deal. Um, we were talking colloidal silver earlier and silver thiol sulfate, all these things to reverse a plant. Um, I just want to confirm when you use colloidal silver on a plant, you absolutely should not smoke that plant material. You should not use that plant material in edibles. You have to just throw that stuff away. Is that kind of the agreed upon consensus for everybody? Absolutely. absolutely. I also, um, I also don't grow, um, anything else in that soil. Um, be, when I spray a lot of it on there, it's aluminum, it's a heavy metal. Um, I know the plant will uptake it. So um, be weary of that. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't put that in like my living soil pots. If I was, you know, I'd, I don't really, um, I don't thin that much. This is the first time I've done thin THC stuff ever. So, um, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that in the same way that you would do a male or something in your living soil system. I'd be weary of, um, you know, kind of heavy metal danger. I don't have any, um, like I haven't got that soil tested. I probably should actually, um, uh, just to see what one round, one plant right. like actually did to the soil, you know? Um, I haven't done that though. So I'm not speaking from a data standpoint, but I agree. Um, generally you're not going to smoke the plant if you reversed it because it's going to be pollen or male, yeah, you know, true. but, but, but absolutely like, like I was talking about, if you reverse, one portion of the plant and then the rest you got to get the seeds out of um and that flower may seem usable i would i would not smoke that or do anything like that get it tested if you really are like i need this this is my medicine Mm -hmm. send it send a sample off somewhere and figure out if it's got a lot of heavy metals in it but i would be weary of consuming any of that shit um just 
to err on the side of safety. <laughs> yeah, always good to go there. And I'm glad you mentioned the soil too, because yeah, again, yeah. it's it's this stuff is systemic. That's why if you treat one side but still got the seeded bud on the other, you don't, yeah. you know, one in the same, same vascular system. Totally. Awesome. Well, all right. Yeah, um, great point, Chad. Yeah, great points. Thanks. You know, it's becoming more and more common. Um, a lot of people are, you know, doing the reversal thing. And so that's uh, something that needs to get out there along with that information. Too. Yeah, because you don't want the guy reversing and then he's, oh, I'm going to smoke this too since it flowered a little bit. You know, <laughs> you don't want I would, that. <laughs> I would say same goes for any of the things that you would do to reverse a plant. You know, not just colloidal silver, but definitely, you know, STS if you're adding gibberellic acid or doing any of the kind of weird hormonal old school shit. The only thing I would, you know, say is safe to do is if you just manipulate the photo period so much that you herm your plant out and then you have some some feminized seed, then I would say that's probably safe. But yeah, any of the, the additives or the spray ons that you're going to do, you know, that lots of people sell feminized sprays now. And I don't necessarily know that the ingredient list is on there. I make my own, but I don't know, you know, little bottles of riot seed spray or whoever, you know, um, don't use any of that product for anything else but making seeds. I think that's a smart thing. Yeah, definitely. And um, there was one more question. I'm sorry, real quick. I'm curious too. It was radical cannabis. Um, so if you reverse a plant and then you pollinate plant B over here, safe to consume plant B, even though there is no, there yeah. is no spray. So the pollen isn't Absolutely. going to magically. I don't, okay. I mean, not that we're aware i don't have any i don't have any data to back this up you know like what that paul i haven't tested like some pollen you know so yeah yeah. like within reason there's probably a certain level of adding pollen to this thing that may not be safe but yeah i would say that yeah totally totally safe i would consume it we have in the past in big commercial environments you know i would reverse 24 plants um and that would give me you know six or eight thousand square feet of canopy being pollinated um (laughs) and all of those you know all of that material was sent off to be made into distillate hemp distillate and all those hemp distillates were tested for heavy metals and nothing showed up so i would say that any of the pollen stuff that you put on there it's totally safe to consume yeah also if you think about the volume you decide so if you sprayed a plant that plant created pollen well it takes one grain of pollen to make a seed so how much actually could have been in one grain of pollen and then transferred to the new plant B. You know, you kind of got to break some of these things down to the simplest form. Absolutely. And, a and gram- live your life. You a know. gram of pollen will pollinate a lot of square feet. <laughs> but, but like one one po- one piece of pollen, like yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, like one, one seed. To seed. Yeah, that's nothing, that's, that's tiny. Cool. All right. Well, I can keep this going indefinitely, but I won't. Cool. Brian, tomorrow, Thursday, what is coming up, sir? Uh, we'll be ta- talking with Leighton. Uh, we we're trying to talk uh, subjects and have debates. Uh, hopefully that will be next week. So uh, we'll figure that part out and come to you guys. But uh, hats off to everybody that wants to see the debates. Uh, again, I'm working behind the scenes, and it seems like uh, we might have our first one set in stone here soon. Hmm. Cool. That'll yeah. be good. That'll be good. Cause I know one of Peter's big things is healthy conversation. That's how we learn on either side. We just have to find the right characters to keep it healthy. So. And kind of set the bar. I think the first one, if, you know, if we have some quality ones for the first three, let's say, you know, it's going to be pretty hard for some, some individual to then come in and act like a clown or try to clown in another person yeah. uh, when other people haven't done it. This will be a gentleman's duel. Yes. Yeah, I thought I thought that was debate was about is to like kick right. somebody's ass intellectually. Like yes, you know, correct. Listen to their point and then counterpoint and then you know. just talk it out. That's all. <coughs> I'm just picturing uh, two, Christopher two Hitchens. You know who that guy is? You oh, I got him? him over there. Okay. Christopher Hitchens is the best debater I've ever seen in my life. So if you ever want to just watch someone in the art form of it, check that dude out. Unfortunately, he passed away. Like. I don't know, a while ago, but uh, when you really want to talk about complex subjects, that dude was on point. Sam Harris, have you guys ever heard of him? He's another dude. Like, check that dude out, you know? I mean, there's there's ways to articulate things and, and show that you're uh, intellectually, maybe even sometimes superior uh, without being an asshole about it. And that's what really I think people 
uh, admire is when you're just like mm -hmm. you do it in a in a classy way and i think that's why debates were always you know, a competitive thing because there are people that can articulate things better than others um, and th that's part of it that's a good healthy debate right not a, one person wins one person loses yeah yeah I, I do enjoy a good debate so i'm looking forward to those and that'll be coming up soon that'll be awesome um and then Thursdays, as always, we've got Hota's Herb, Grow and Tell. Uh, I will be back Saturday with another Perfectly Imperfect Grow show. Um, but with that, let's let's give it over. Brian, Marco, I want to get let you guys get your info out there one more time, and then I'll turn it over to you, Greg, for the last word. All right, I'll just go ahead and say thank you, Greg. This was a great show. I always say this, the ones that go quick are the good ones. This one was like the longest show we've ever done, but it seems like one of the shortest <laughs> just because of the amount of info and, um, and and vibe. You know, you got a great vibe. I like the way you do things. A lot of what you do is kind of reminds me of, you know, like I do. If we were neighbors, we'd be, you know, grow buddies. You know what I mean? So much respect to what you're doing, man. And I'm definitely going to be checking out the website and support you on that. And uh, I'd like to see Miss Fantasia down here in Virginia sometime soon. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Greg kind of personifies not only do you need to be a good farmer, but you have to have a quality network and you want to network with quality people. And, uh, you know, just hats off to you, buddy. I think everybody knows that I'm, I'm a big fan of you and I'm glad that you came on for the third time. Always dropping knowledge and I just always, you know, I hope you guys go and check out his prices and, and look over his stuff if you're thinking about buying seeds for 2022 fair prices and now that you've you know listened to him if you want to dive deeper again he's been on the show a couple of times so uh you know just somebody again that i feel like the community needs to know about uh i don't know how you guys always feel when i get like this cheerleady about people but um this is definitely somebody to support so if you are thinking about it man just uh check out his stuff there's a reason why he won the cup amongst his peers and why just uh, uh most of uh the people that are um, in Colorado, definitely have heard of them, uh, whether they admit it or not. Oh, <laughs> thank you to uh, Bryce supporting uh, the the rubber ducky isopods. Bryce, 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 appreciate you, brother. Uh, there's just a lot of knowledge that's going out there and uh, trying to take it. Uh, so I just appreciate everybody that allows me to uh, have a a business, but also continue this uh, with yeah with fantastic geeks. So thank you, sir. I know that you're a farmer as well. I learned that you're uh, a big fan of the show. So uh, just everybody that supported us last week, thank you. I will see you this weekend in Nebraska. Uh, just, again, I uh, cannot, cannot put into words whatever this is becoming, man. And uh, whoever thought that I'd be selling bugs and hustling that like cannabis. But I really do appreciate everybody that's been supporting it. And look out for some uh, co-branding with Marco and myself, uh, Johnny Mindfully Rooted and myself. Uh, we are going to really take the bioactive thing to the next level. So appreciate you, fellas. A real salute for that because uh, I, I talk about quality. I'm getting quality. So thank you, fellas. Yes, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Man. Right on. Well, well, thank you guys so much for having me, for sure. And, um, you know, it's always an honor being on here and, uh, you know, chopping it up with, like you say, some of the best minds in the business, man. So, Marco, um, I'm anxious to try, you know, some of your, uh, some of your lines, man, some of your, your, um, nutrients and stuff, man. And I, you know, I wish I was more local. I kind of keep it hyper local too, but, um, you know, to where you are, but you know, um, always love seeing people doing the thing, closing loops, keeping it, you know, the community vibe high. So, um, much respect to you as well. Um, and yeah, I just, uh, you know, if you guys are interested in good genetics, um, hit me up on the IG, um, my genome alchemy, my where's the seed.com site will be up here shortly. Uh, like I said, I'll be at the secret stash. If anybody's going, um, find me there. Um, and yeah, hit me up via email, um, Greg at genome If you want to see the, um, seed menu or interested or just want to chop it up, whatever, all good. Um, nothing but love around here. So, um, I appreciate y'all having me. 
Freaking awesome. Thank you guys for another entertaining show, another educational show. I've enjoyed it, and everybody in chat enjoyed it too. So I just want to give chat a big thank you again uh, for hanging out and catch us, uh, catch us again next Wednesday, 1 p.m. on the West Coast, 4 p.m. on the East Coast, somewhere in the middle, in the middle. So with that, I will say peace out, everybody. You have a great day. Later.